Section 19 of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert. Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce. Translated by Douglas Ainsley. Historical Summary, Part 1. 1. Aesthetic Ideas in Greco-Roman Antiquity The question as to whether aesthetic should be looked upon as ancient or modern has often been discussed. The answer will depend upon the view taken of the nature of aesthetic. Benedetto Croce has proved that aesthetic is the science of expressive activity, but this knowledge cannot be reached until has been defined the nature of imagination of representation, of expression, or whatever we may term that faculty which is theoretic but not intellectual, which gives knowledge of the individual but not of the universal. Now the deviations from this, the correct theory, may arise in two ways, by defect or by excess. Negation of the special aesthetic activity, or of its autonomy, is an instance of the former. This amounts to a mutilation of the reality of the spirit. Of the latter, the substitution or superposition of another mysterious and non-existent activity is an example. These errors each take several forms. That which errs by defect may be a. Pure hedonism, which looks upon art as merely sensual pleasure, b. Rigoristic hedonism, agreeing with A, but adding that art is irreconcilable with the loftiest activities of man, C, moralistic or pedagogic hedonism, which admits, with the two former, that art is mere sensuality, but believes that it may not only be harmless, but of some service to morals, if kept in proper subjection and obedience. The error by excess also assumes several forms, but these are indeterminable a priori. This view is fully dealt with under the name of mystic, in the theory, and in the appendix. Greco-Roman antiquity was occupied with the problem in all these forms. In Greece, the problem of art and of the artistic faculty arose for the first time after the sophistic movement, as a result of the Socratic polemic. With the appearance of the word mimesis, or mimetic, we have a first attempt at grouping the arts and the expression allegoric, or its equivalent, used in defense of Homer's poetry, reminds us of what Plato called, quote, the old quarrel between philosophy and poetry, end quote. But when internal facts were all looked upon as mere phenomena of opinion or feeling, of pleasure or of pain, of illusion or of arbitrary caprice, there could be no question of beautiful or ugly, or difference between the true and the beautiful, or between the beautiful and the good. The problem of the nature of art assumes as solved those problems concerning the difference between rational and irrational, material and spiritual, bare fact and value, etc., this was first done in the Socratic period, and therefore the aesthetic problem could only arise after Socrates. And in fact it does arise with Plato, the author of the only great negation of art which appears in the history of ideas. Is art rational or irrational? Does it belong to the noble region of the soul where dwell philosophy and virtue? or does it cohabit with sensuality and with crude passion in the lower regions? This was the question that Plato asked, and thus was the aesthetic problem stated for the first time. His Gorgias remarks, with sceptical acumen, that tragedy is a deception which brings honour alike to deceived and to deceiver, and therefore it is blameworthy not to know how to deceive, and not to allow oneself to be deceived. This suffices for Gorgias, but Plato the philosopher must resolve the doubt. 
if it be in fact deception, down with tragedy and the other arts. If it be not deception, then what is the place of tragedy in philosophy and in righteous life? His answer was that art or mimetic does not realize the ideas or the truth of things, but merely reproduces natural or artificial things, which are themselves mere shadows of the ideas. Art, then, is but a shadow of a shadow, a thing of third-rate degree. The artificer fashions the object which the painter paints. The artificer copies the divine idea, and the painter copies him. Art, therefore, does not belong to the rational, but to the irrational, sensual sphere of the soul. It can serve but for sensual pleasure, which disturbs and obscures. Therefore must mimetic, poetry, and poets be excluded from the perfect republic. Plato observed with truth that imitation does not rise to the logical or conceptual sphere of which poets and painters as such are in fact ignorant, but he failed to realize that there could be any form of knowledge other than the intellectual. We now know that intuition lies on this side or outside the intellect, from which it differs as much as it does from passion and sensuality. Plato, with his fine aesthetic sense, would have been grateful to anyone who could have shown him how to place art, which he loved and practised so supremely himself, among the lofty activities of the spirit. But in his day no one could give him such assistance. His conscience and his reason saw that art makes the false seem the true, and therefore he resolutely banished it to the lower regions of the spirit. The tendency among those who followed Plato in time was to find some means of retaining art and of depriving it of the baleful influence which it was believed to exercise. Life without art was to the beauty-loving Greek an impossibility, although he was equally conscious of the demands of reason and of morality. Thus it happened that art, which, on the purely hedonistic hypothesis, had been treated as a beautiful courtesan, became in the hands of the moralist a pedagogue. Aristophanes and Strabo, and above all Aristotle, dwell upon the didactic and moralistic possibility of poetry. For Plutarch, poetry seems to have been a sort of preparation for philosophy, a twilight to which the eyes should grow accustomed before emerging into the full light of day. Among the Romans we find Lucretius, comparing the beauties of his great poem to the sweet yellow honey, with which doctors are wont to anoint the rim of the cup containing their bitter drugs. Horace, as so frequently, takes his inspiration from the Greek when he offers the double view of art as courtesan and as pedagogue. In his Ad Pisones occur the passages in which we find mingled with the poetic function that of the orator, the practical and the aesthetic. Quote, Was Virgil a poet or an orator? End quote. The triple duty of pleasing, moving, and teaching was imposed upon the poet. Then, with a thought for the supposed meretricious nature of their art, the ingenious Horace remarks that both must employ the seductions of form. The mystic view of art appeared only in late antiquity with Plotinus. The curious error of looking upon Plato as the head of this school and as the father of aesthetic assumes that he who felt obliged to banish art altogether from the domain of the higher functions of the spirit was yet ready to yield to it the highest place there. The mystical view of aesthetic accords a lofty place indeed to aesthetic, placing it even above philosophy. The enthusiastic praise of the beautiful to be found in the Gorgias, Philebus, Phaedrus, and Symposium is responsible for this misunderstanding, but it is well to make perfectly clear that the beautiful, of which Plato discourses in those dialogues, has nothing to do with the artistically beautiful, nor with the mysticism of the Neoplatonicians. 
Yet the thinkers of antiquity were aware that a problem lay in the direction of aesthetic, and Xenophon records the sayings of Socrates, that the beautiful is, quote, that which is fitting and answers to the end required, end quote. Elsewhere, he says, quote, it is that which is loved, end quote. Plato likewise vibrates between various views and offers several solutions. Sometimes he appears almost to confound the beautiful with the true, the good, and the divine. At others, he leans toward the utilitarian view of Socrates. At others, he distinguishes between what is beautiful in itself and what possesses but a relative beauty. At other times again, he is a hedonist and makes it to consist of pure pleasure, that is, of pleasure with no shadow of pain. Or he finds it in measure and proportion, or in the very sound, the very color itself. The reason for all this vacillation of definition lay in Plato's exclusion of the artistic or mimetic fact from the domain of the higher spiritual activities. The Hippias Major expresses this uncertainty more completely than any of the other dialogues. What is the beautiful? That is the question asked at the beginning, and left unanswered at the end. The Platonic Socrates and Hippias propose the most various solutions, one after another, but always come out by the gate by which they entered in. Is the beautiful to be found in ornament? No, for gold embellishes only where it is in keeping. Is the beautiful that which seems ugly to no man? But it is a question of being, not of seeming. Is it their fitness which makes things seem beautiful? But in that case, the fitness which makes them appear beautiful is one thing, the beautiful another. If the beautiful be the useful, or that which leads to an end, then evil would also be beautiful, because the useful may also end evilly. Is the beautiful the helpful, that which leads to the good? No, for in that case the good would not be beautiful, nor the beautiful good, because cause and effect are different. Thus they argued in the Platonic Dialogues, and when we turn to the pages of Aristotle, we find him also uncertain and inclined to vary his definitions. Sometimes for him the good and pleasurable are the beautiful, sometimes it lies in actions, at others in things motionless, or in bulk and order, or is altogether undefinable. Antiquity also established canons of the beautiful, and the famous canon of Polycletus, on the proportions of the human body, fitly compares with that of later times on the golden line, and with the Ciceronian phrase from the Tusculan disputations. But these are all of them mere empirical observations, mere happy remarks and verbal substitutions, which lead to unsurmountable difficulties when put to philosophical test. One important identification is absent in all those early attempts at truth. The beautiful is never identified with art, and the artistic fact is always clearly distinguished from beauty, mimetic from its content. Plotinus first identified the two, and with him the beautiful and art are dissolved together in a passion and mystic elevation of the spirit. The beauty of natural objects is the archetype existing in the soul, which is the fountain of all natural beauty. Thus was Plato, he said, in error, when he despised the arts for imitating nature, for nature herself imitates the idea, and art also seeks her inspiration directly from those ideas whence nature proceeds. We have here, with Plotinus and with Neoplatonism, the first appearance in the world of mystical aesthetic, destined to play so important a part in later aesthetic theory. Aristotle was far more happy in his attempts at defining aesthetic as the science of representation and of expression than in his definitions of the beautiful. He felt that some element of the problem had been overlooked, and in attempting in his turn a solution, he had the advantage over Plato 
of looking upon the ideas as simple concepts, not as hypostases of concepts, or of abstractions. Thus reality was more vivid for Aristotle. It was the synthesis of matter and form. He saw that art, or mimetic, was a theoretic fact, or a mode of contemplation. Quote, but if poetry be a theoretic fact, in what way is it to be distinguished from science and from historical knowledge? End quote. Thus magnificently does the great philosopher pose the problem at the commencement of his poetics, and thus alone can it be posed successfully. We ask the same question in the same words today, but the problem is difficult and the masterly statement of it was not equalled by the method of solution then available. He made an excellent start on his voyage of discovery, but stopped halfway, irresolute and perplexed. Poetry, he says, differs from history by portraying the possible, while history deals with what has really happened. Poetry, like philosophy, aims at the universal, but in a different way, which the philosopher indicates as something more, malon tha catholon, which differentiates poetry from history, occupied with the particular, malon tha kath ekiston. What then is the possible, the something more, and the particular of poetry? Aristotle immediately falls into error and confusion when he attempts to define these words, since art has to deal with the absurd and the impossible, it cannot be anything rational, but a mere imitation of reality, in accordance with the Platonic theory, a fact of sensual pleasure. Aristotle does not, however, attain to so precise a definition as Plato, whose erroneous definition he does not succeed in supplanting. The truth is that he failed of his self-imposed task. He failed to discern the true nature of aesthetic, although he restated and re-examined the problem with such marvellous acumen. After Aristotle there comes a lull in the discussion until Plotinus. The poetics were generally little studied, and the admirable statement of the problem generally neglected by later writers. Antique psychology knew the fancy or imagination as preserving or reproducing sensuous impressions, or as an intermediary between the concepts and the feeling. Its autonomous productive activity was not yet understood. In The Life of Apollonius of Tyana, Philostratus is said to have been the first to make clear the difference between mimetic and creative imagination but this does not in reality differ from the Aristotelian mimetic, which is concerned not only with the real, but also with the possible. Cicero, too, before Philostratus, speaks of a kind of exquisite beauty lying hidden in the soul of the artist, which guides his hand and art. Antiquity seems generally to have been entrammeled in the meshes of the belief in mimetic, or the duplication of natural objects by the artist Philostratus and the other protagonists of the imagination may have meant to combat this error, but the shadows lie heavy until we reach Plotinus. We find already astir among the sophists the question as to the nature of language. Admitting that language is a sign, are we to take that as signifying a spiritual necessity, phusis, or as a psychological convention, nomus. Aristotle made a valuable contribution to this difficult question when he spoke of a kind of proposition other than those which predicate truth or falsehood, that is, logic. With him, UK, is the term proper to designate desires and aspirations, which are the vehicle of poetry and of oratory. It must be remembered that for Aristotle words like poetry belong to mimetic. The profound remark about the third mode of proposition would, one would have thought, have led naturally to the separation of linguistic from logic, and to its classification with poetry and art. But the Aristotelian logic assumed a verbal and formal character, which set back the attainment of this position by many hundred years. 
yet the genius of Epicurus had an intuition of the truth when he remarked that the diversity of names for the same thing arose not from arbitrary caprice, but from the diverse impression derived from the same object. The Stoics, too, seem to have had an inkling of the non-logical nature of speech, but their use of the word lecton leaves it doubtful whether they distinguished by it the linguistic representation from the abstract concept, or rather, generically, the meaning from the sound. 2. Aesthetic Ideas in the Middle Age and in the Renaissance Well nigh all the theories of antique aesthetic reappear in the Middle Ages, as it were by spontaneous generation. Duns Scotus Eregina translated the Neoplatonic mysticism of the Pseudo-Dionysus, the Christian God took the place of the chief good or idea. God, wisdom, goodness, supreme beauty are the fountains of natural beauty, and these are steps in the stair of contemplation of the Creator. In this manner speculation began to be diverted from the art fact which had been so prominent with Plotinus. Thomas Aquinas followed Aristotle in distinguishing the beautiful from the good, and applied his doctrine of imitation to the beauty of the second person of the Trinity, in quantum est imago expressa patris. With the troubadours, we may find traces of the hedonistic view of art, and the rigoristic hypothesis finds in Tertullian and in certain fathers of the Church staunch upholders. The retrograde Savonarola occupied the same position at a later period, but the narcotic, moralistic, or pedagogic view mostly prevailed, for it best suited an epoch of relative decadence in culture. It suited admirably the Middle Age, offering at once an excuse for the newborn Christian art, and for those works of classical or pagan art which yet survived. Specimens of this view abound all through the Middle Age, we find it, for instance, in the criticism of Virgil, to whose work were attributed four distinct meanings, literal, allegorical, moral, and anagogic. For Dante, poetry was nihil aliud quam fictio rhetorica in musicac posita. Quote, if the vulgar be incapable of appreciating my inner meaning, then they shall at least incline their minds to the perfection of my beauty. If from me ye cannot gather wisdom, at the least shall ye enjoy me as a pleasant thing. End quote. Thus spoke the muse of Dante, whose convivio is an attempt to aid the understanding in its effort to grasp the moral and pedagogic elements of verse. Poetry was the Gaia Sienza, quote, a fiction containing many useful things covered or veiled, end quote. It would be inexact to identify art in the Middle Age with philosophy and theology. Its pleasing falsity could be adapted to useful ends much in the same way as matrimony excuses love and sexual union. This, however, implies that for the Middle Age the ideal state was celibacy, that is, pure knowledge divorced from art. The only line of explanation that was altogether neglected in the Middle Age was the right one. The poetics of Aristotle were badly rendered into Latin from the faulty paraphrase of Averroes by one Hermann, 1256. The nominalist and realist dispute brought again into the arena the relations between thought and speech, and we find Duns Scotus occupied with the problem in his De modus significandi su grammatica speculativa. Abelard had defined sensation as confusa conceptio, and with the importance given to intuitive knowledge, to the perception of the individual, of the species specialissima in Duns Scotus, together with the denomination of the forms of knowledge as confuse, indistincte, and distincte, we enter upon a terminology which we shall see appearing again, big with results, at the commencement of modern aesthetic. The doctrine of the Middle Age 
in respect to art and letters, may thus be regarded as of interest rather to the history of culture than to that of general knowledge. A like remark holds good of the Renaissance. Theories of antiquity are studied, countless treatises in many forms are written upon them, but no really new ideas, as regards aesthetic science, appear on the horizon. We find among the spokesmen of mystical aesthetic in the 13th century such names as Marsilio Ficino and Pico della Mirandola. Bembo and many others wrote on the beautiful and on love in the century that followed. The Dialoghi di Amor, written in Italian by a Spanish Jew named Leon and published in 1535, had a European success, being translated into many languages. He talks of the universality of love and of its origin, of beauty, that is grace, which delights the soul and impels it to love. Knowledge of lesser beauties leads to loftier spiritual beauties. Leon called these remarks philographia. Petrarch's followers versified similar intuitions, while others wrote parodies and burlesques of this style. Luca Paciolo, the friend of Leonardo, made the false discovery of the golden section, basing his speculating upon mathematics. Michelangelo established an empirical canon for painting, attempting to give rules for imparting grace and movement to figures by means of certain arithmetical proportions. Others found special meanings in colors. While the Platonicians placed the seat of beauty in the soul, the Aristotelians in physical qualities. Agostino Nifo, the Averroist, after several inconclusive remarks, is at last fortunate enough to discover where natural beauty really dwells. Its abode is the body of Giovanna d'Argona, princess of Tagliacozzo, to whom he dedicates his book. Tasso mingled the speculations of the Hippias Major with those of Plotinus. Tommaso Campanella, in his Poetica, looks upon the beautiful as signum boni, the ugly as signum mali. By goodness he means power, wisdom, and love. Campanella was still under the influence of the erroneous Platonic conception of the beautiful, but the use of the word sign in this place represents progress. It enabled him to see that things in themselves are neither beautiful nor ugly. Nothing proves more clearly that the Renaissance did not overstep the limits of aesthetic theory reached in antiquity than the fact that the pedagogic theory of art continued to prevail in the face of translations of the poetics of Aristotle and of the diffuse labors expended upon that work. This theory was even grafted upon the poetics, where one is surprised to find it. There are a few hedonists standing out from the general trend of opinion. The restatement of the pedagogic position, reinforced with examples taken from antiquity, was disseminated throughout Europe by the Italians of the Renaissance. France, Spain, England, and Germany felt its influence, and we find the writers of the period of Louis the Fourteenth, either frankly didactic, like Le Bossu, 1675, for whom the first object of the poet is to instruct, or with Le Menadier, 1640, speaking of poetry as cette science agréable qui mêle la gravité des préceptes avec la douceur du langage. For the former of these critics, Homer was the author of two didactic manuals relating to military and political matters, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Didacticism has always been looked upon as the poetic of the Renaissance, although the didactic is not mentioned among the kinds of poetry of that period. The reason of this lies in the fact that for the Renaissance all poetry was didactic, in addition to any other qualities which it might possess. The active discussion of poetic theory, the criticism of Aristotle and of Plato's exclusion of poetry, of the possible and of the verisimilar, if it did not contribute much original material to the theory of art, yet at any rate sowed the seeds which afterward germinated and bore fruit. Why, they asked with Aristotle, at the Renaissance, 
Does poetry deal with the universal, history with the particular? What is the reason for poetry being obliged to seek verisimilitude? What does Raphael mean by the certain idea, which he follows in his painting? These themes and others cognate were dealt with by Italian and by Spanish writers, who occasionally reveal wonderful acumen, as when Francesco Patrizio, criticizing Aristotle's theory of imitation, remarks, quote, all languages and all philosophic writings and all other writings would be poetry because they are made of words and words are imitations. End quote. But as yet no one dared follow such a clue to the labyrinth, and the Renaissance closes with the sense of a mystery yet to be revealed. End of section nineteen. Recorded by Lisa Reichert. Historical Summary of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sharon Greer Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce Translated by Douglas Ainsley, 1865-1948 Section 3, 17th and 18th Centuries The 17th century is remarkable for the ferment of thought upon this difficult problem. Such words as genius, taste, imagination or fancy and feeling appear in this literature and deserve a passing notice. As regards the word genius, we find the Italian ingenio opposed to the intellect and dialectic adorned with the attributes of the latter while rhetoric has the advantage of ingenio in all its forms, such as concetti and acutezzi. With these, the English word ingenious has an obvious connection, especially in its earlier use as applied to men of letters. The French worked upon the word ingenio and evolved from it in various associations the expressions esprit, beaux esprits. The manual of the Spanish Jesuit Balthazar Gracian became celebrated throughout Europe and here we find ingenio described as the truly inventive faculty and from it the English word genius, the Italian genio, the French genie first enter into general use. The word gusto or taste, good taste in its modern sense, also sprang into use about this time. Taste was held to be a judicial faculty directed to the beautiful, and thus to some extent distinct from the intellectual judgment. It was further bisected into active and passive, but the former ran into the definition of ingenio, the latter described sterility. The word gusto or taste as judgment was in use in Italy at a very early period and in Spain we find Lope de Vega and his contemporaries declaring that their object is to delight the taste of their public. These uses of the word are not of significance as regards the problem of art and we must return to Balthazar Gracian 1642 for a definition of taste as a special faculty or attitude of the soul. Italian writers of the period echo the praises of this laconic moralist, who, when he spoke of a man of taste, meant to describe what we call today a man of tact in the conduct of life. The first use of the word in a strictly aesthetic sense occurs in France in the last quarter of the 17th century. La Bruyere writes in his character, 1688, Il y a dans l'art un point de perfection, comme de bonté ou de maturité dans la nature. Celui qui le sent et qui l'aime a le goût parfait, celui qui ne le sent pas et qui l'aime au de ça ou de là a le goût défectueux. Il y a donc un bon et un mauvais goût, et l'on dispute des goûts avec fondement. Delicacy and variability or variety were appended as attributes of taste. This French definition of the Italian word was speedily adopted in England, where it became good taste, and we find it used in this sense in Italian and German writers of about this period. The words imagination and fancy were also passed through the crucible in this century. 
we find the Cardinal Sforza of Pallavicino, 1644, blaming those who took for truth or falsehood, for the very similar or for historical truth in poetry. Poetry, he holds, has to do with the primary apprehensions, which give neither truth nor falsehood. Thus, the fancy takes the place of the very similar of certain students of Aristotle. The Cardinal continues his eloquence with the clinching remark that if the intention of poetry were to be believed true, then its real end would be falsehood, which is absolutely condemned by the law of nature and by God. The sole object of poetic fables is, he says, to adorn our intellect with sumptuous, new, marvellous and splendid imaginings. And so great has been the benefits accruing from this to the human race that poets have been rewarded with a glory superior to any other, and their names have been crowned with divine honours. This he says in his treatise, Del Bene, has been the just reward of poets, albeit they have not been bearers of knowledge, nor have they manifested truth. This throwing of the bridle on the neck of Pegasus seemed to Moratori sixty years later to be altogether too risky a proceeding, although advocated by a prince of the church. He reinserts the bit of the very similar, though he talks with admiration of the fancy, that inferior apprehensive faculty which is content to represent things without seeking to know if they be true or false, a task which it leaves to the superior apprehensive faculty of the intellect. The severe Gravina, too, finds his heart touched by the beauty of poetry when he calls it a witch but wholesome. As early as 1578, Huarte had maintained that eloquence is the work of the imagination, not of the intellect. In England, Bacon, 1605, attributed knowledge to the intellect, history to memory, and poetry to the imagination or fancy. Hobbes described the manifestations of the latter, and Addison devoted several numbers of the spectator to the analysis of the pleasures of the imagination. During the same period, the division between those who are accustomed à jugar par les sentiments and those who raisonnent par les principes became marked in France. De Bosse, 1719, is an interesting example of the upholder of the feelings as regards the production of art. Indeed, there is, in his view, no other criterion, and the feeling for art is a sixth sense, against which intellectual argument is useless. This French school of thought found a reflex in England, with the position assigned there to emotion in artistic work. But the confusion of such words as imagination, taste, feeling, wit, shows that at this time there was a suspicion that these words were all applicable to the same fact. Alexander Pope thus distinguished wit and judgment. For wit and judgment often are at strife, they meant each other's aid like man and wife. But there was a divergence of opinion as to whether the latter should be looked upon as part of the intellect or not. There was the same divergence of opinion as to taste and intellectual judgment. As regards the former, the opposition to the intellectual principle was reinforced in the 18th century by Kant in his Critique der Urteilskraft. But Voltaire and writers anterior to him frequently fell back into intellectualist definitions of a word invented precisely to avoid them. Dacier, 1684, writes of taste as une harmonie, un accord de l'esprit et de la raison. The difficulties surrounding a true definition led to the creation of the expression non so che, or je ne sais quoi, or no se que, which throws into clear relief the confusion between taste and intellectual judgment. As regards imagination and feeling, or sentiment, there was a strong tendency to sensualism. The Cardinal Sforza of Pallavicino talks of poetry as ignoring alike truth or falsehood and yet delighting the senses. He approves of the remark that poetry should make us raise our eyebrows, but in later life this keen-eyed prince seems to have fallen back 
from the brilliant intuition of his early years into the pedagogic theory. Muratori was convinced that fancy was entirely sensual, and therefore he posted the intellect beside it, to refrain its wild courses, like a friend having authority. Gravina practically coincides in this view of poetic fancy, as a subordinate faculty incapable of knowledge, fit only to be used by moral philosophy for the introduction into the mind of the true by means of novelty and the marvellous. In England, also, Bacon held poetry to belong to the fancy and assigned to it a place between history and science. Epic poetry he awarded to the former, parabolic poetry to the latter. Elsewhere, he talks of poetry as a dream and affirms that it is to be held rather as an amusement of the intelligence than as a science. For him, music, painting, sculpture and the other arts are merely pleasure-giving. Addison reduced the pleasures of the imagination to those caused by visible objects or by ideas taken from them. These pleasures he held to be inferior to those of the senses and less refined than those of the intellect. He looked upon imaginative pleasure as consisting in resemblances discovered between imitations and things imitated, between copies and originals, an exercise adapted to sharpen the spirit of observation. The sensualism of the writers headed by Dubois, who looked upon art as a mere pastime, like a tournament or a bullfight, shows that the truth about aesthetic had not yet succeeded in emerging from the other spiritual activities. Yet the new words and the new views of the 17th century have great importance for the origins of aesthetic. They were the direct result of the restatement of the problem by the writers of the Renaissance, who themselves took it up where antiquity had left it. These new words and the discussions which arose from them were the demands of aesthetic for its theoretical justification. But they were not able to provide this justification and it could not come from elsewhere. With Descartes, we are not likely to find much sympathy for such studies as relate to wit, taste, fancy or feelings. He ignored the famous non soce. He abhorred the imagination, which he believed to result from the agitation of the animal spirits. He did not altogether condemn poetry, but certainly looked upon it as the folle du logis, which must be strictly supervised by the reason. Boileau is the aesthetic equivalent of Cartesian intellectualism. Boileau, que la raison a ses règles engage. Boileau, the enthusiast for allegory. France was infected with the mathematical spirit of Cartesianism and all possibility of a serious consideration of poetry and of art was thus removed. Witness the diatribes of Malabranche against the imagination – and listen to the Italian Antonio Conti, writing from France in 1756 on the theme of the literary disputes that were raging at the time. They have introduced the method of Monsieur Descartes into belles lettres. They judge poetry and eloquence independently of their sensible qualities. Thus they also confound the progress of philosophy with that of the arts. The Abbé Terrasson says that the moderns are greater geometricians than the ancients. Therefore, they are greater orators and greater poets. La Motte, Fontenelle, Boileau and Malabranche carried on this battle, which was taken up by the encyclopedists, and when Dubois published his daring book, Jean-Jacques Lebel published a reply to it, 1726, in which he denied to sentiment its claim to judge of art. Thus, Cartesianism could not possess an aesthetic of the imagination. The Cartesian J.P. de Cruzaz, 1715, found the beautiful to consist in what is approved of and thereby reduced it to ideas, ignoring the pleasing and sentiment. Locke was an intellectualist in the England of this period, as was Descartes in France. He speaks of wit as combining ideas in an agreeable variety which strikes the imagination while the intellect or judgment seeks for differences according to truth. The wit then consists of something which is not at all in accordance with truth and reason. For Shaftesbury, 
taste is a sense or instinct for the beautiful of order and proportion identical with the moral sense and with its preconceptions anticipating the recognition of reason body spirit and god are the three degrees of beauty francis hutcheson proceeded from shaftesbury and made popular the internal sense of beauty which lies somewhere between sensuality and rationality and is occupied with discussing unity in variety concord in multiplicity and the true the good and the beautiful in the substantial identity hutcheson allied the pleasure of art with this sense that is with the pleasure of imitation and of the likeness of the copy to the original this he looked upon as relative beauty to be distinguished from absolute beauty the same view dominates the english writers of the eighteenth century among whom may be mentioned reed the head of the scottish school and adam smith with far greater philosophical vigour Leibniz in Germany opened the door to that crowd of psychic facts which Cartesian intellectualism had rejected with horror. His conception of reality as continuous, natura non facit saltus, left room for imagination, taste, and their congeners. Leibniz believed that the scale of being ascended from the lowliest to God. What we now term aesthetic facts were then identified with what Descartes and Leibniz had called confused knowledge, which might become clear but not distinct. It might seem that when he applied this terminology to aesthetic facts, Leibniz had recognised their peculiar essence as being neither sensual nor intellectual. They are not sensual for him because they have their own clarity, differing from pleasure and sensual emotion, and from intellectual distinctio. But the Leibnizian law of continuity and intellectualism did not permit of such an interpretation. Obscurity and clarity are here to be understood as quantitative grades of a single form of knowledge, the distinct or intellectual towards which they both tend and reach at a superior grade. Though artists judge with confused perceptions, which are clear but not distinct, these may yet be corrected and proved true by intellective knowledge. The intellect clearly and distinctly knows the thing which the imagination knows confusedly, but clearly. This view of Leibniz amounts to saying that the realisation of a work of art can be perfected by intellectually determining its concept. Thus Leibniz held that there was only one true form of knowledge and that all other forms could only reach perfection in that. His clarity is not a specific difference, it is merely a partial anticipation of his intellective distinction. To have Posited this grade is an important achievement, but the view of Leibniz is not fundamentally different from that of the creators of the words and intuitions already studied. All contributed to attract attention to the peculiarity of aesthetic facts. Speculation on language at this period revealed an equally determined intellectualist attitude. Grammar was held to be an exact science and grammatical variations to be explainable by the ellipse, by abbreviation and by failure to grasp the typical logical form. In France, with Arnold 1660, we have the rigorous Cartesian intellectualism. Leibniz and Locke both speculated upon this subject and the former all his life nourished the thought of a universal language. The absurdity of this is proved in this volume. A complete change of the Cartesian system upon which Leibniz based his own was necessary if speculation were ever to surpass the Leibnizian aesthetic. But Wolf and the other German pupils of Leibniz were as unable to shake themselves free of the all-pervading intellectualism as were the French pupils of Descartes. Meanwhile, a young student of Berlin named Alexander Amadeus Baumgarten was studying the Wolfian philosophy and at the same time lecturing in poetry and Latin rhetoric. While so doing, he was led to rethink and pose afresh the problem of how to reduce the precepts of rhetoric to a rigorous philosophical system. 
Thus it came about that Baumgarten published in September 1735 at the age of 21 as the thesis of his degree of doctor an opuscule entitled Meditationes Philosophicae de non nullis ad poema pertinentibus and in it we find written for the first time the word aesthetic as the name of a special science Baumgarten ever afterwards attached great importance to his juvenile discovery and lectured upon it by request in 1742 at Frankfurt on the Oder and again in 1749. It is interesting to know that in this way Immanuel Kant first became acquainted with the theory of aesthetic which he greatly altered when he came to treat of it in his philosophy. In 1750, Baumgarten published the first volume of a more ample treatise and a second part in 1762, but illness and death in 1762 prevented his completing his work. What is aesthetic for Baumgarten? It is the science of sensible knowledge. Its objects are the sensible facts, aestheta, which the Greeks were always careful to distinguish from the mental facts, noeta. It is therefore scientia cognitionis sensitive, theoria liberalium artium, nociologia inferia, ars pulcre cognitande, ars analogi rationis. Rhetoric and poetic are for him special cases of aesthetic, which is a general science embracing both. Its laws are diffused among all the arts, like the mariner's star, Sinosura Quedam, and they must be always referred to in all cases, for they are universal, not empirical, or merely inductive. Falsa regula pejor esquam nulla. Aesthetic must not be confounded with psychology, which supplies only suppositions. Aesthetic is an independent science which gives the rules for knowing sensibly and is occupied with the perfection of sensible knowledge, which is beauty. Its contrary is ugliness. The beauty of objects and of matter must be excluded from the beauty of sensible knowledge because beautiful objects can be badly thought and ugly objects beautifully thought. Poetic representations are those which are confused or imaginative. Distinction and intellectuality are not poetic. The greater the determination, the greater the poetry. Individuals absolutely determined, omnimodo determinata, are very poetical, as are images or fancies and everything which refers to feeling. The judgment of sensible and imaginative representations is taste. Such are, in brief, the truths which Baumgarten stated in his Meditationes and further developed and exemplified in his Aesthetica. Close study of the two works above mentioned leads to the conviction that Baumgarten did not succeed in freeing himself from the unity of the Leibnizian monodology. He obtained from Leibniz his conception of the poetic as consisting of the confused, but German critics are wrong in believing that he attributed to it a positive, not a negative quality. Had he really done this, he would have broken at a blow the unity of the Leibnizian monad and conquered the science of aesthetic. This giant step he did not take. He failed to banish the contradictions of Leibniz and of the other intellectualists. To posit a perfection did not suffice. It was necessary to maintain it against the lex continui of Leibniz and to proclaim its independence of all intellectualism. Aesthetic truths for Baumgarten were those which did not seem altogether false or altogether true. In fact, the very similar. If it were objected to Baumgarten that one should not occupy oneself with what, like poetry, he defines as confused and obscure, he would reply that confusion is a condition of finding the truth, that we do not pass at once from night to dawn. 
Thus he did not surpass the thought of Leibnitz in this respect. Poor Baumgarten was always in suspense, lest he should be held to occupy himself with things unworthy of a philosopher. How can you, a professor of philosophy, dare to praise lying and the mixture of truth and falsehood? He imagined that some such reproach might be addressed to him on account of his purely philosophical speculations, and true enough, he actually received a criticism of his theory, in which it was argued that if poetry consisted of sensual perfection, then it was a bad thing for mankind. Baumgarten contemptuously replied that he had not the time to argue with those capable of confounding his oratio perfecta sensitiva with an oratio perfecte omnimno sensitiva. The fact about Baumgarten is that apart from baptising the new science aesthetic and apart from his first definitions, he does not stray far from the old ruts of scholastic thought. The excellent Baumgarten, with all his ardour and all his convictions, is a sympathetic and interesting figure in the history of aesthetic, not yet formed, but in the process of formation. End of historical summary, part two. Section 21 of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce. Translated by Douglas Ainsley. Historical Summary, Part 3. The revolutionary who set aside the old definitions of aesthetic and for the first time revealed the true nature of art in poetry is the Italian Giambattista Vico. What were the ideas developed by Vico in his Scienza Nuova, 1725? They were neither more nor less than the solution of the problem posed by Plato, attempted in vain by Aristotle, again posed and again unsolved at the Renaissance. Is poetry a rational or an irrational thing? Is it spiritual or animal? If it be spiritual, what is its true nature, and in what way does it differ from art and science? Plato, we know, banished poetry to the inferior region of the soul, among the animal spirits. Vico, on the contrary, raises up poetry, and makes of it a period in the history of humanity. And since Vico's is an ideal history, whose periods are not concerned with contingent facts but with spiritual forms, he makes of it a moment of the ideal history of the spirit, a form of knowledge. Poetry comes before the intellect but after feeling. Plato had confused it with feeling, and for that reason banished it from his Republic. Men feel, says Vico, before observing, then they observe with perturbation of the soul. Finally, they reflect with the pure intellect. He goes on to say that poetry being composed of passion and of feeling, the nearer it approaches to the particular, the more true it is, while exactly the reverse is true of philosophy. Imagination is independent and autonomous as regards the intellect. Not only does the intellect fail of perfection, but all it can do is to destroy it. Quote, the studies of poetry and metaphysic are naturally opposed. Poets are the feeling, philosophers the intellect of the human race. End quote. The weaker the reason, the stronger the imagination. Philosophy, he says, deals with abstract thought or universals, poetry with the particular. Painters and poets differ only in their material. Homer and the great poets appear in barbaric times. Dante, for instance, appeared in the renewed barbarism of Italy. The poetic ages preceded the philosophical, and poetry is the father of prose by necessity of nature, not by the caprice of pleasure. Fables, or imaginary universals, were conceived before reasoned or philosophical universals. To Homer, says Vico, belongs wisdom but only poetic wisdom. Quote, his beauties are not those of a spirit softened and civilized by any philosophy, end quote. 
If anyone make poetry in epochs of reflection, he becomes a child again. He does not reflect with his intellect, but follows his fancy and dwells upon particulars. If the true poet make use of philosophic ideas, he only does so that he may change logic into imagination. Here we have a profound statement of the line of demarcation between science and art. They cannot be confused again. His statement of the difference between poetry and history is a trifle less clear. He explains why, to Aristotle, poetry seemed more philosophical than history, and at the same time he refutes Aristotle's error that poetry deals with the universal, history with the particular. Poetry equals science, not because it is occupied with the intellectual concept, but because, like science, it is ideal. A good poetical fable must be all ideal. Quote, With the idea the poet gives their being to things which are without it. Poetry is all fantastic, as being the art of painting the idea, not ictastic like the art of painting portraits. That is why poets, like painters, are called divine, because in that respect they resemble God the Creator. End quote. Vico ends by identifying poetry and history. The difference between them is posterior and accidental. Quote, but as it is impossible to impart false ideas, because the false consists of a vicious combination of ideas, so it is impossible to impart a tradition which, though it be false, has not at first contained some element of truth. Thus, mythology appears for the first time, not as the invention of an individual, but as the spontaneous vision of the truth as it appears to primitive man. End quote. Poetry and language are, for Vico, substantially identical. He finds in the origins of poetry the origins of languages and letters. He believed that the first languages consisted in mute acts or acts accompanied by bodies which had natural relations to the ideas that it was desired to signify. With great cleverness, he compared these pictured languages to heraldic arms and devices and to hieroglyphs. He observed that during the barbarism of the Middle Age, the mute language of signs must return, and we find it in the heraldry and blazonry of that epoch. Hence come three kinds of languages, divine silent languages, heroic emblematic languages, and speech languages. Formal logic could never satisfy a man with such revolutionary ideas upon poetry and language. He describes the Aristotelian syllogism as a method which explains universals in their particulars, rather than unites particulars to obtain universals, looks upon Zeno and the Sorites as a means of subtilizing rather than sharpening the intelligence, and concludes that Bacon is a great philosopher when he advocates and illustrates induction, quote, which has been followed by the English to the great advantage of experimental philosophy, end quote. Hence, he proceeds to criticize mathematics, which had hitherto always been looked upon as the type of the perfect science. Vico is indeed a revolutionary, a pioneer. He knows very well that he is in direct opposition to all that has been thought before about poetry. Quote, My new principles of poetry upset all that first Plato and then Aristotle have said about the origin of poetry. All that has been said by the Patrizzi, by the Scaligers, and by the Castelvetri. I have discovered that it was through lack of human reason that poetry was born so sublime that neither the arts, nor the poetics, nor the critiques could cause another equal to it to be born. I say equal and not superior. End quote. He goes so far as to express shame at having to report the stupidities of great philosophers upon the origin of song and verse. He shows his dislike for the Cartesian philosophy and its tendency to dry up the imagination by denying all the faculties of the soul which come to it from the body, and talks of his own time as of one which freezes all the generous quality of the best poetry and thus precludes it from being understood. As regards grammatical forms, Vico may be described as an adherent of the great reaction of the Renaissance 
against scholastic verbalism and formalism. This reaction brought back as a value the experience of feeling, and afterwards with Romanticism gave its right place to the imagination. Vico, in his Ciencia Nuova, may be said to have been the first to draw attention to the imagination. Although he makes many luminous remarks on history and the development of poetry among the Greeks, his work is not really a history, but a science of the spirit or of the ideal. It is not the ethical, logical, or economic moment of humanity which interests him, but the imaginative moment. He discovered the creative imagination, and it may almost be said of the Ciencia Nuova of Vico that it is aesthetic, the discovery of a new world, of a new mode of knowledge. This was the contribution of the genius of Vico to the progress of humanity. He showed aesthetic to be an autonomous activity. It remained to distinguish the science of the spirit from history, the modifications of the human spirit from the historic vicissitudes of peoples, aesthetic from Homeric civilization. But although Goethe, Herder, and Wolff were acquainted with the Ciencia Nuova, the importance of this wonderful book did not at first dawn upon the world. Wolff, in his Prolegomena to Homer, thought that he was dealing merely with an ingenious speculator on Homeric themes. He did not realize that the intellectual stature of Vico far surpassed that of the most able philologists. The fortunes of aesthetic after Vico were very various, and the list of aestheticians who fell back into the old pedagogic definition or elaborated the mistakes of Baumgarten is very long. Yet, with C. H. Heidenreich in Germany and Sulzer in Switzerland, we find that the truths contained in Baumgarten have begun to bear fruit. J. J. Herder, 1769, was more important than these, and he placed Baumgarten upon a pedestal. Though criticizing his pretension of creating an ars pulcher cogitandi instead of a simple scientia de pulcuro et pulcuris philosophice cogitans, Herder admitted Baumgarten's definition of poetry as oratio sensitiva perfecta, perfect sensitivized speech, and this is probably the best definition of poetry that has ever been given. It touches the real essence of poetry and opens to thought the whole of the philosophy of the beautiful. Herder, although he does not cite Vico upon aesthetic questions, yet praises him as a philosopher. His remarks about poetry as, quote, the maternal language of humanity, as the garden is more ancient than the cultivated field, painting than writing, song than declamation, exchange than commerce, end quote, are replete with the spirit of the Italian philosopher. But despite similar happy phrases, Herder is philosophically the inferior of the great Italian. He is a firm believer in the Leibnizian law of continuity, and does not surpass the conclusions of Baumgarten. Herder and his friend Hamann did good service as regards the philosophy of language. The French encyclopedists J.J. Rousseau, de Lambert, and many others of this period were none of them able to get free of the idea that a word is either a natural, mechanical fact, or a sign attached to a thought. The only way out of this difficulty is to look upon the imagination as itself active and expressive in verbal imagination, and language as the language of intuition, not of the intelligence. Herder talks of language as an understanding of the soul with itself. Thus, language begins to appear not as an arbitrary invention or a mechanical fact, but as a primitive affirmation of human activity, as a creation. But all unconscious of the discoveries of Vico, the great mass of 18th century writers try their hands at every sort of solution. The Abbé Batteux, published in 1746, Les Beaux Arts Reduits un Sol Principe, which is a perfect little bouquet of contradictions. The Abbé finds himself confronted with difficulties at every turn. But with Un Peau d'Esprit en Citier de Tour, and when, for instance, he has to explain artistic enjoyment of things displeasing, 
he remarks that the imitation never being perfect like reality, the horror caused by reality disappears. But the French were equaled and indeed surpassed by the English in their amateur aesthetics. The painter Hogarth was one day reading in Italian a speech about the beauty of certain figures attributed to Michelangelo. This led him to imagine that the figurative arts depend upon a principle which consists of conforming to a given line. In 1745, he produced a serpentine line as frontispiece of his collection of engravings, which he described as the line of beauty. Thus, he succeeded in exciting universal curiosity, which he proceeded to satisfy with his analysis of beauty. Here he begins by rightly combating the error of judging paintings by their subject and by the degree of their imitation, instead of by their form, which is the essential in art. He gives his definition of form, and afterwards proceeds to describe the waving lines which are beautiful and those which are not, and maintains that among them all there is but one that is really worthy to be called the line of beauty, and one definite serpentine line, the line of grace. The pig, the bear, the spider, and the frog are ugly because they do not possess serpentine lines. E. Burke, with a like assurance in his examples, was equally devoid of certainty in his general principles. He declares that the natural properties of an object cause pleasure or pain to the imagination, but that the latter also procures pleasure from their resemblance to the original. He does not speak further of the second of these, but gives a long list of the natural properties of the sensible, beautiful object. Having concluded his list, he remarks that these are, in his opinion, the qualities upon which beauty depends, and which are the least liable to caprice and confusion. But comparative smallness, delicate structure, coloring vivid but not too much so, are all mere empirical observations of no more value than those of Hogarth, with whom Burke must be classed as an aesthetician. Their works are spoken of as classics. Classics indeed they are, but of the sort that arrive at no conclusion. Henry Holm, Lord Kames, is on a level a trifle above the two just mentioned. He seeks the true principles of the beaux arts in order to transform criticism into a rational science. He selects facts and experience for this purpose, but in his definition of beauty, which he divides into two parts, relative and intrinsic, he is unable to explain the latter, save by a final cause, which he finds in the Almighty. Such theories as the three above mentioned defy classification, because they are not composed by any scientific method. Their authors pass from physiological sensualism to moralism, from imitation of nature to finalism, and to transcendental mysticism without consciousness of the incongruity of their theses, at variance each with itself. The German, Ernest Plotner, at any rate did not suffer from a like confusion of thought. He developed his researches on the lines of Hogarth, but was only able to discover a prolongation of sexual pleasure in aesthetic facts. Where, he exclaims, quote, is there any beauty that does not come from the feminine figure, the center of all beauty? The undulating line is beautiful because it is found in the body of woman. Essentially feminine movements are beautiful. The notes of music are beautiful when they melt into one another. A poem is beautiful when one thought embraces another with lightness and facility." End quote. French sensualism shows itself quite incapable of understanding aesthetic production, and the associationism of David Hume is not more fortunate in this respect. The Dutchman Hemsterhuis, 1769, developed an ingenious theory mingling mystical and sensualist theory with some just remarks which, afterwards, in the hands of Jacobi, became sentimentalism. Hemsterhuis believed beauty to be a phenomenon arising from the meeting by the sentimentalism, which gives multiplicity, with the internal sense, which leads to unity. Consequently, the beautiful will be that which presents the greatest number of ideas in the shortest space of time. 
to man is denied supreme unity, but here he finds approximative unity. Hence the joy arising from the beautiful, which has some analogy with the joy of love. With Winkelmann, 1764, Platonism or Neoplatonism was vigorously renewed. The creator of the history of the figurative arts saw in the divine indifference and more than human elevation of the works of Greek sculpture a beauty which had descended from the seventh heaven and become incarnate in them. Mendelssohn, the follower of Baumgarten, had denied beauty to God. Winkelmann, the Neoplatonetician, gave it back to him. He holds that perfect beauty is to be found only in God. Quote, the conception of human beauty becomes the more perfect in proportion, as it can be thought as in agreement with the Supreme Being, who is distinguished from matter by his unity and indivisibility. End quote. To the other characteristics of supreme beauty, Winkelmann adds the absence of any sort of signification. Unbezichnung. Lines and dots cannot explain beauty, for it is not they alone which form it. Its form is not proper to any definite person. It expresses no sentiment, no feeling of passion, for these break up unity and diminish or obscure beauty. According to Winkelmann, beauty must be like a drop of pure water taken from the spring, which is the more healthy the less it has of taste because it is purified of all foreign elements. A special faculty is required to appreciate this beauty, which Winkelmann is inclined to call intelligence, or a delicate internal sense free of all instinctive passions, of pleasure, and of friendship. Since it becomes a question of perceiving something immaterial, Winkelmann banishes color to a secondary place. True beauty, he says, is that of form, a word which describes lines and contours, as though lines and contours could not also be perceived by the senses, or could appear to the eye without any color. It is the destiny of error to be obliged to contradict itself, when it does not decide to dwell in a brief aphorism, in order to live as well as may be with facts and concrete problems. The history of Winkelmann dealt with historic concrete facts with which it was necessary to reconcile the idea of a supreme beauty. His admission of the contours of lines and his secondary admission of colors is a compromise. He makes another with regard to the principle of expression. Quote, Since there is no intermediary between pain and pleasure in human nature, and since a human being without these feelings is inconceivable, we must place the human figure in a moment of action and of passion, which is what is termed expression in art. End quote. So Winkelmann studied expression after beauty. He makes a third compromise between his one indivisible, supreme, and constant beauty and individual beauties. Winkelmann preferred the male to the female body as the most complete incarnation of supreme beauty but he was not able to shut his eyes to the indisputable fact that there also exist beautiful bodies of women and even of animals. Raphael Mengs, the painter, was an intimate friend of Winkelmann and associated himself with him in his search for a true definition of the beautiful. His ideas were generally in accordance with those of Winkelmann. He defines beauty as the visible idea of perfection, which is to perfection what the visible is to the mathematical point. He falls under the influence of the argument from design. The Creator has ordained the multiplicity of beauties. Things are beautiful according to our ideas of them, and these ideas come from the Creator. Thus, each beautiful thing has its own type, and a child would appear ugly if it resembled a man. He adds to his remarks in this sense, quote, as the diamond is alone perfect among stones, gold among metals, and man among living creatures, so there is distinction in each species, and but little is perfect. End quote. In his dreams of beauty, he looks upon beauty as an intermediate disposition, which contains a part of perfection and a part of the agreeable, and forms a tertium quid, which differs from the other two and deserves a special name. He names four sources of the art of painting, beauty, 
significant or expressive character, harmony, and coloring. The first of these he finds among the ancients, the second with Raphael, the third with Correggio, the fourth with Titian. Mengs does not succeed in rising above this empiricism of the studio, save to declaim about the beauty of nature, virtue, forms, and proportions, and indeed everything, including the first cause, which is the most beautiful of all. The name of G. E. Lessing, 1766, is well known to all concerned with art problems. The ideas of Winkelmann reappear in Lessing, with less of a metaphysical tinge. For Lessing, the end of art is the pleasing, and since this is a superfluous thing, he thought that the legislator should not allow to art the liberty indispensable to science, which seeks the truth necessary to the soul. For the Greeks, painting was, as it should always be, imitation of beautiful bodies. Everything disagreeable or ill-formed should be excluded from painting. Quote, painting as clever imitation may imitate deformity. Painting as a fine art does not permit this. End quote. He was more inclined to admit deformity in poetry, as there it is less shocking, and the poet can make use of it to produce in us certain feelings, such as the ridiculous or the terrible. In his Dramaturgy, 1767, Lessing followed the peripatetics and believed that the rules of Aristotle were as absolute as the theorems of Euclid. His polemic against the French school is chiefly directed to claiming a piece in poetry for the verisimilar, as against absolute historical exactitude. He held the universal to be a sort of mean of what appears in the individual. The catharsis was, in his view, a transformation of the passions into virtuous dispositions, and he held the duty of poetry to be inspiration of the love of virtue. He followed Winkelmann in believing that the expression of physical beauty was the supreme object of painting. This beauty exists only as an ideal, which finds its highest expression in man. Animals possess it to a slighter extent, vegetable and inanimate nature not at all. Those mistaken enough to occupy themselves with depicting the latter are imitating beauties deprived of all ideal. They work only with eye and hand. Genius has little if any share in their productions. Lessing found the physical ideal to reside chiefly in form, but also in the ideal of color and in permanent expression. Mere coloring and transitory expression were for him without ideal, quote, because nature has not imposed upon herself anything definite as regards them, end quote. At bottom, he does not care for coloring, finding in the pen drawings of artists, quote, a life a liberty, a delicacy lacking to their pictures. End quote. He asks quote, whether even the most wonderful coloring can make up for such a loss, and whether it be not desirable that the art of oil painting had never been invented. End quote. This ideal beauty, wonderfully constructed from divine quintessence and subtle pen and brush strokes, this academic mystery had great success. In Italy, it was much discussed in the environment of Mengs and of Winkelmann, who were working there. The first counterblast to their aesthetic Neoplatonism came from an Italian named Spalletti and took the form of a letter addressed to Mengs. He represents the characteristic as the true principle of art. The pleasure obtained from beauty is intellectual, and truth is its object. When the soul meets with what is characteristic, and what really suits the object to be represented, the work is held to be beautiful. A well-made man with a woman's face is ugly. Harmony, order, variety, proportion, etc., these are elements of beauty, and man enjoys the widening of his knowledge before disagreeable things characteristically represented. Spalletti defines beauty as, quote, that modification inherent to the object observed, which presents it as it should appear, with an infallible characteristic. Thus, the Aristotelian thesis found a supporter in Italy, some years before any protestation was heard in Germany. 
Lewis Hurt, the historian of art, 1797, observed that ancient monuments represented all sorts of forms, from the most beautiful and sublime to the most ugly and most common. He therefore denied that ideal beauty was the principle of art, and for it substituted the characteristic applicable equally to gods, heroes, and animals. End of section 21. Recording by Will Irache, www.willsvoice.com. Section 22 of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lisa Reichert. Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce. Translated by Douglas Ainsley. Historical Summary, Part 4. Wolfgang Goethe, in 1798, forgetting the juvenile period, during which he had dared to raise a hymn to Gothic architecture, now began seriously to seek a middle term between beauty and expression. He believed that he had found it, in certain characteristic contents presenting to the artist beautiful shapes, which the artist would then develop and reduce to perfect beauty. Thus for Goethe at this period, the characteristic was simply the starting point or framework from which the beautiful arose through the power of the artist. But these writers mentioned after J. B. Vico are not true philosophers. Winkelmann, Mengs, Hogarth, Lessing, and Goethe, are great in other ways. Meyer called himself a historian of art, but he was inferior both to Herder and to Hamann. From J. B. Vico to Immanuel Kant, European thought is without a name of great importance as regards this subject. Kant took up the problem, where Vico had left it, not in the historical, but in the ideal sense. He resembled the Italian philosopher, in the gravity and the tenacity of his studies in aesthetic, but he was far less happy in his solutions, which did not attain to the truth, and to which he did not succeed in giving the necessary unity and systematization. The reader must bear in mind that Kant is here criticized solely as an aesthetician. His other conclusions do not enter directly into the discussion. What was Kant's idea of art? The answer is the same in substance as Baumgarten's. This may seem strange to those who remember his sustained polemic against Wolf and the conception of beauty as confused perception, but Kant always thought highly of Baumgarten. He calls him that excellent analyst in the critique of pure reason, and he used Baumgarten's text for his university lectures on metaphysic. Kant looked upon logic and aesthetic as cognate studies, and in his scheme of studies for 1765, and in the Critique of Pure Reason, he proposes to cast a glance at the Critique of Taste, that is to say, aesthetic. Quote, Since the study of the one is useful for the other, and they are mutually illuminative. End quote. He followed Meyer in his distinctions between logical and aesthetic truth. He even quoted the instance of the young girl, whose face when distinctly seen, i.e. with a microscope, is no longer beautiful. It is true, aesthetically, he said, that when a man is dead he cannot come to life, although this be opposed both to logical and to moral truth. It is aesthetically true that the sun plunges into the sea, although that is not true logically or objectively. No one, even among the greatest, can yet tell to what extent logical truth should mingle with aesthetic truth. Kant believed that logical truth must wear the habit of aesthetic, in order to become accessible. This habit, he thought, was discarded only by the rational sciences, which tend to depth. Aesthetic certainly is subjective. It is satisfied with authority, or with appeal to great men. We are so feeble that aesthetic must eke out our thoughts. Aesthetic is a vehicle of logic. But there are logical truths which are not aesthetic. We must exclude from philosophy exclamations and other emotions which belong to aesthetic truth. 
For Kant, poetry is the harmonious play of thought and sensation, differing from eloquence because in poetry thoughts are fitted to suggestions. In eloquence the reverse is true. Poetry should make virtue and intellect visible, as was done by Pope in his Essay on Man. Elsewhere, he says frankly that logical perfection is the foundation of all the rest. The confirmation of this is found in his Critique of Judgment, which Schelling looked upon as the most important of the three critiques, and which Hegel and other metaphysical idealists always especially esteemed. For Kant, art was always, quote, a sensible and imaged covering for an intellectual concept, end quote. He did not look upon art as pure beauty, without a concept. He looked upon it as a beauty adherent and fixed about a concept. The work of genius contains two elements, imagination and intelligence. To these must be added taste, which combines the two. Art may even represent the ugly in nature, for artistic beauty, quote, is not a beautiful thing, but a beautiful representation of a thing, end quote. But this representation of the ugly has its limits in the arts. Here Kant remembers Lessing and Winckelmann. And an absolute limit in the disgusting and the repugnant, which kills the representation itself. He believes that there may be artistic productions without a concept, such as are flowers in nature, and these would be ornaments to frameworks, music without words, etc., etc. But, since they represent nothing reducible to a definite concept, they must be classed, like flowers, with free beauties. This would certainly seem to exclude them from aesthetic, which, according to Kant, should combine imagination and intelligence. Kant is shut in with intellectualist barriers. A complete definition of the imagination is wanting to his system. He does not admit that the imagination belongs to the powers of the mind. He relegates it to the facts of sensation. He is aware of the reproductive and combinative imagination, but he does not recognize fancy, fantasia, which is the true productive imagination. Yet Kant was aware that there exists an activity other than the intellective. Intuition is referred to by him as preceding intellective activity and differing from sensation. He does not speak of it, however, in his Critique of Art, but in the first section of the Critique of Pure Reason. Sensations do not enter the mind until it has given them form. This is neither sensation nor intelligence. It is pure intuition, the sum of the a priori principles of sensibility. He speaks thus, quote, there must then exist a science that forms the first part of the transcendental doctrine of the elements, distinct from that which contains the principles of pure thought and is called transcendental logic, end quote. What does he call this new science? He calls it transcendental aesthetic and refuses to allow the term to be used for the critique of taste, which could never become a science. But, although he thus states so clearly the necessity of a science of the form of the sensations, that is of pure intuition, Kant here appears to fall into grave error. This arises from his inexact idea of the essence of the aesthetic faculty, or of art, which, as we now know, is pure intuition. He conceives the form of sensibility to be reducible to the two categories of space and time. Benedetto Croce has shown that space and time are far from being categories or functions. They are complex posterior formations. Kant, however, looked upon density, color, etc., as material for sensations, but the mind only observes color or hardness when it has already given a form to its sensations. Sensations, in so far as they are crude matter, are outside the mind. They are a limit. Color, hardness, density, etc., are already intuitions. They are the aesthetic activity in its rudimentary manifestation. Characterizing or qualifying imagination, that is, aesthetic activity, should therefore take the place occupied by the study of space and time, 
in the critique of pure reason, and constitute the true transcendental aesthetic, prologue to logic. Had Kant done this, he would have surpassed Leibniz and Baumgarten. He would have equaled Vico. Kant did not identify the beautiful with art. He established what he called the four moments of beauty, amounting to a definition of it. The two negative moments are, quote, that is beautiful which pleases without interest, end quote. This thesis was directed against the sensualist school of English writers, with whom Kant had for a time agreed, and, quote, that is beautiful which pleases without a concept, end quote, directed against the intellectualists. Thus he affirmed the existence of a spiritual domain, distinct from that of organic pleasure, of the useful, the good, and the true. The two other moments are, quote, that is beautiful which has the form of finality without the representation of an end, end quote, and, quote, that is beautiful which is the object of universal pleasure, end quote. What is this disinterested pleasure that we experience before pure colors, pure sounds, and flowers? Benedetto Croce replies that this mysterious domain has no existence, that the instances cited represent either instances of organic pleasure or are artistic facts of expression. Kant was less severe with the Neoplatonicians than with the two schools of thought above mentioned. His Critique of Judgment contains some curious passages, in one of which he gives his distinction of form from matter. Quote, in music the melody is the matter, harmony the form. In a flower, the scent is the matter, the shape or configuration the form. End quote. In the other arts, he found that the design was the essential. Quote, Not what pleases in sensation, but what is approved for its form is the foundation of taste. End quote. In his pursuit of the phantom of a beauty, which is neither that of art nor of sensual pleasure, exempt alike from expression and from enjoyment, he became enveloped in inextricable contradictions. Little disposed as he was to let himself be carried away by the imagination, he expressed his contempt for philosopher-poets, like Herder, and kept saying and unsaying, affirming and then immediately criticizing his own affirmations, as to this mysterious beauty. The truth is, that this mystery is simply his own individual uncertainty before a problem which he could not solve, owing to his having no clear idea of an activity of sentiment. Such an activity represented for him a logical contradiction. Such expressions as, quote, necessary universal pleasure, end quote, quote, finality without the idea of end, end quote, are verbal proofs of his uncertainty. How was he to emerge from this uncertainty, this contradiction? He fell back upon the concept of a base of subjective finality as the base of the judgment of taste, that is, of the subjective finality of nature by the judgment. But nothing can be known or disclosed to the object by means of this concept, which is indeterminate in itself and not adapted for knowledge. Its determining reason is perhaps situated in, quote, the suprasensible substratum of humanity. End quote. Thus beauty becomes a symbol of morality. Quote, the subjective principle alone, that is, the indeterminate idea of the suprasensible in us, can be indicated as the sole key to reveal this faculty, which remains unknown to us in its origin. Nothing but this principle can make that hidden faculty comprehensible. End quote. Kant had a tendency to mysticism, which this statement does not serve to conceal, but it was a mysticism without enthusiasm, a mysticism almost against the grain. His failure to penetrate thoroughly the nature of the aesthetic activity led him to see double and even triple on several occasions. Art being unknown to him in its essential nature, he invents the functions of space and time, and terms this transcendental aesthetic. He develops the theory of the imaginative beautifying of the intellectual concept by genius. 
he is finally forced to admit a mysterious power of feeling, intermediate between the theoretic and the practical activity. This power is cognoscitive and non-cognoscitive, moral and indifferent to morality, agreeable and yet detached from the pleasure of the senses. His successors hastened to make use of this mysterious power, for they were glad to be able to find some sort of justification for their bold speculations in the severe philosopher of Königsberg. In addition to Schelling and Hegel, for whom, as has been said, the critique of judgment seemed the most important of the three critiques, we must now mention the name of a poet who showed himself as great in philosophical as in aesthetic achievement. Friedrich Schiller first elaborated that portion of the Kantian thought contained in the Critique of Judgment. Before any professional philosopher, Schiller studied that sphere of activity which unites feeling with reason. Hegel talks with admiration of this artistic genius, who was also so profoundly philosophical, and first announced the principle of reconciliation between life as duty and reason on the one hand, and the life of the senses and feeling on the other. To Schiller belongs the great merit of having opposed the subjective idealism of Kant, and of having made the attempt to surpass it. The exact relations between Kant and Schiller, and the extent to which the latter may have been influenced by Leibniz and Herder, are of less importance to the history of aesthetic than the fact that Schiller unified once for all art and beauty, which had been separated by Kant, with his distinctions between adherent and pure beauty. Schiller's artistic sense must doubtless have stood him here in good stead. Schiller found a very unfortunate and misleading term to apply to the aesthetic sphere. He called it the sphere of play, spiel. He strove to explain that by this he did not mean ordinary games, nor material amusement. For Schiller, this sphere of play lay intermediate between thought and feeling. Necessity in art gives place to a free disposition of forces. Mind and nature, matter and form are here reconciled. The beautiful is life, but not physiological life. A beautiful statue may have life, and a living man be without it. Art conquers nature with form. The great artist effaces matter with form. The less we are sensible of the material in a work of art, the greater the triumph of the artist. The soul of the spectator should leave the magic sphere of art as pure and as perfect as when it left the hands of the creator. The most frivolous theme should be so treated that we can pass at once from it to the most rigorous, and vice versa. Only when man has placed himself outside the world and contemplates it aesthetically can he know the world. While he is merely the passive receiver of sensations, he is one with the world, and therefore cannot realize it. Art is indeterminism. With the help of art, man delivers himself from the yoke of the senses, and is at the same time free of any rational or moral duty. He may enjoy for a moment the luxury of serene contemplation. Schiller was well aware that the moment art is employed to teach morals directly, it ceases to be art. All other teachings give to the soul a special imprint. Art alone is favorable to all without prejudice. Owing to this indifference of art, it possesses a great educative power, by opening the path to morality without preaching or persuasion, without determining it produces determinability. This was the main theme of the celebrated Letters on the Aesthetic Education of Man, which Schiller wrote to his patron the Duke of Holstein Augustenberg. Here, and in his lectures at the University of Jena, it is clear that Schiller addresses himself to a popular audience. He began a work on scientific aesthetic, which he intended to entitle Callias, but unfortunately died without completing it. We possess only a few fragments, contained in his correspondence with his friend Körner. Körner did not feel satisfied with the formula of Schiller, and asked for some more precise and objective mark of the beautiful. Schiller tells him that he has found it, but what he had found we shall never know, as there is no document to inform us. The fault of Schiller's aesthetic theory was its lack of precision. 
his artistic faculty enabled him to give unsurpassable descriptions of the catharsis and of other effects of art, but he fails to give a precise definition of the aesthetic function. True, he dissociates it from morality, yet admits that it may, in a measure, be associated with it. The only formal activities that he recognizes are the moral and the intellectual, and he denies altogether, against the sensualists, that art can have anything to do with passion or sensuality. His intellectual world consisted only of the logical and the intellectual, leaving out the imaginative activity. What is art for Schiller? He admits four modes of relation between man and the external things. They are the physical, the logical, the moral, and the aesthetic. He describes this latter as a mode by which things affect the whole of our different forces, without being a definite object for any one in particular. Thus a man may be said to please aesthetically, quote, when he does so without appealing to any one of the senses directly, and without any law or end being thought of in connection with him. End quote. Schiller cannot be made to say anything more definite than this. His general position was probably much like Kant's, save in the case above mentioned, where he made a happy correction. And he probably looked upon aesthetic as a mingling of several faculties, as a play of sentiment. Schiller was faithful to Kant's teaching in its main lines, and his uncertainty was largely due to this. The existence of a third sphere uniting form and matter was for Schiller rather an ideal conformable to reason than a definite activity. It was suppositious rather than effective. But the Romantic movement in literature, which was at that time gaining ground, with its belief in a superhuman faculty called imagination, ingenious breaker of rules, found no such need for restraint. Schiller's modest reserve was set aside, and with J. P. Richter, we approach a mythology of the imagination. Many of his observations are, however, just, and his distinction between productive and reproductive imagination is excellent. How could humanity appreciate works of genius, he asks, were it without some common measure? All men who can go as far as saying, this is beautiful, before a beautiful thing, are capable of the latter. He then proceeds to establish, to his own satisfaction, categories of the imagination, leading from simple talent to the supreme form of male genius, in which all faculties flourish together, a faculty of faculties. The romantic conception of art is, in substance, that of idealist German philosophy, where we find it in a more coherent and systematic form. It is the conception of Schelling, Zolger, and Hegel. Fichte, Kant's first great pupil, cannot be included with these, for his view of aesthetic, largely influenced by Schiller, is transformed in the Fichtean system to a moral activity, to a representation of the ethical ideal. The subjective idealism of Fichte, however, generated an aesthetic, that of irony as the base of art. The eye that has created the universe can also destroy it. The universe is a vain appearance, smiled at by the ego its creator, who surveys it as an artist his work, from without and from above. For Friedrich Schlegel, art was a perpetual farce, a parody of itself. Antique defined irony as a force which allows the poet to dominate his material. Novalis, that romantic Fichtian, dreamed of a magical idealism, an art of creating by an instantaneous act of the ego, but Schelling's system of transcendental idealism was the first great philosophical affirmation of romanticism and of conscious Neoplatonism reborn in aesthetic. Schelling has obviously studied Schiller, but he brings to the problem a mind more purely philosophical and a method more exactly scientific. He even takes Kant to task for a faultiness of method. His remarks as to Plato's position are curious, if not conclusive. He says that Plato condemned the art of his time because it was realistic and naturalistic. Like all antique art, it exhibited a finite character. Plato's judgment would have been quite different had he known Christian art, of which the character is infinity. 
Schelling held firm to the fusion of art and beauty effected by Schiller, but he combated Winkelmann's theory of abstract beauty with its negative conception of the characteristic, assigning to art the limits of the individual. Art is characteristic beauty. It is not the individual, but the living conception of the individual. When the artist recognizes the eternal idea in an individual and expresses it outwardly, he transforms the individual into a world apart, into a species, into an eternal idea. Characteristic beauty is the fullness of form which slays form. It does not silence passion, but restrains it as the banks of a river, the waters that flow between them, but do not overflow. Schelling's starting point is the criticism of teleological judgment, as stated by Kant in his third critique. Teleology is the union of theoretic with practical philosophy, but the system would not be complete unless we could show the identity of the two worlds, theoretic and practical, in the subject itself. He must demonstrate the existence of an activity which is at once unconscious as nature and conscious as spirit. This activity we find in aesthetic, which is therefore, quote, the general organ of philosophy, the keystone of the whole building, end quote. Poetry and philosophy alone possess the world of the ideal in which the real world vanishes. True art is not the impression of the moment, but the representation of infinite life. It is transcendental intuition objectified. The time will come when philosophy will return to poetry, which was its source, and on the new philosophy will arise a new mythology. Philosophy does not depict real things, but their ideas, so too art. Those same ideas, of which real things are, as philosophy shows, the imperfect copies, reappear in art objectified as ideas, and therefore in their perfection. Art stands nearest to philosophy, which itself stands nearest to the idea, and therefore nearest to perfection. Art differs from philosophy only by its specialization. In all other ways it is the ideal world in its most complete expression. The three ideas of truth, goodness, and beauty correspond to the three powers of the ideal and of the real world. Beauty is not the universal whole, which is truth, nor is it the only reality, which is action. It is the perfect mingling of the two. Quote, Beauty exists where the real or particular is so adequate to its concept that this infinite thing enters into the finite and is contemplated in the concrete. End quote. Philosophy unites truth, morality, and beauty in what they possess in common and deduces them from their unique source, which is God. If philosophy assume the character of science and of truth, although it be superior to truth, the reason for this lies in the fact that science and truth are simply the formal determination of philosophy. Schelling looked upon mythology as a necessity for every art. Ideas are gods, considered from the point of view of reality for the essence of each is equal to God in a particular form. The characteristics of all gods, including the Christian, are pure limitation and absolute indivisibility. Minerva has wisdom and strength, but lacks womanly tenderness. Juno has power and wisdom, but is without amorous charm, which she borrows from the girdle of Venus, who in her turn is without the wisdom of Minerva. What would these gods become without their limitations? They would cease to be the objects of fancy. Fancy is a faculty, apart from the pure intellect and from the reason, distinct from imagination, which develops the products of art. Fancy has intuitions of them, grasps them herself, and herself represents them. Fancy is to imagination as intellectual intuition is to reason. Fancy, then, is intellectual intuition in art. In the thought of Schelling, fancy, the new or artistic intuition, sister of intellectual intuition, came to dominate alike the intellect and the old conception of the fancy and the imagination, in a system for which reason alone did not suffice. C. G. Zolge, 
followed Schelling and agreed with him in finding but little truth in the theories of Kant and especially of Fichte. He held that their dialectic had failed to solve the difficulty of intellectual intuition. He too conceived of fancy as distinct from imagination and divided the former into three degrees. Imagination he held to appertain to ordinary knowledge, quote, which re-establishes the original intuition to infinity, end quote. Fancy, quote, originates from the original antithesis in the idea, and so operates that the opposing elements, which are separated from the idea, become perfectly united in reality. By means of fancy, we are able to understand things more lofty than those of common knowledge, and in them we recognize the idea itself as real. In art, fancy is the faculty of transforming the idea into reality. End quote. For Zolger, as for Schelling, beauty belongs to the region of ideas, which are inaccessible to common knowledge. Art is nearly allied to religion, for as religion is the abyss of the idea, into which our consciousness plunges, that it may become essential, so art and the beautiful resolve in their way the world of distinctions, the universal and the particular. Artistic activity is more than theoretical. It is practical, realized, and perfect, and therefore belongs to practical, not to theoretic philosophy, as Kant wrongly believed. Since art must touch infinity on one side, it cannot have ordinary nature for its object. Art, therefore, ceases in the portrait, and this explains why the ancients generally chose gods or heroes as models for sculpture. Every deity, even in a limited and particular form, expresses a definite modification of the idea. G. G. F. Hegel gives the same definition of art as Zolger and Schelling. All three were mystical aestheticians, and the various shades of mystical aesthetic presented by these three writers are not of great interest. Schelling forced upon art the abstract Platonic ideas, while Hegel reduced it to the concrete idea. This concrete idea was for Hegel the first and lowest of the three forms of the liberty of the spirit. It represented immediate, sensible, objectified knowledge, while religion filled the second place as representative consciousness with adoration, which is an element foreign to art alone. The third place was, of course, occupied by philosophy, the free thought of the absolute spirit. Beauty and truth are one for Hegel. They are united in the idea. The beautiful he defined as the sensible appearance of the idea. Some writers have erroneously believed that the views of the three philosophers above mentioned lead back to those of Baumgarten. But that is not correct. They well understood that art cannot be made a medium for the expression of philosophic concepts. Not only are they opposed to the moralistic and intellectualistic view, but they are its active opponents. Schelling says that aesthetic production is in its essence absolutely free, and Hegel that art does not contain the universal as such. Hegel accentuated the cognoscitive character of art more than any of his predecessors. We have seen that he placed it with philosophy and religion in the sphere of the absolute spirit, but he does not allow either to art or to religion any difference of function from that of philosophy, which occupies the highest place in his system. They are therefore inferior, necessary grades of the spirit. Of what use are they? Of none whatever, or at best, they merely represent transitory and historical phases of human life. Thus we see that the tendency of Hegelianism is anti-artistic, as it is rationalistic and anti-religious. End of section 22. Recorded by Lisa Reichert. Section 23 of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Aesthetic 
as science of expression and general linguistic by bernadetto croce translated by douglas ainsley historical summary part five this result of thought was a strange and a sad thing for one who loved art so fervently as hegel our memories conjure up plato who also loved art well and yet found himself logically obliged to banish the poet from his ideal republic after crowning him with roses but the german philosopher was as staunch to the supposed command of reason as the greek and felt himself obliged to announce the death of art art he says occupies a lofty place in the human spirit but not the most lofty for it is limited to a restricted content and only a certain grade of truth can be expressed in art such are the hellenic gods who can be transfused in the sensible and appear in it adequately the christian conception of truth is among those which cannot be so expressed the spirit of the modern world and more precisely the spirit of our religion and rational development seem to have gone beyond the point at which art is the chief way of apprehending the absolute the peculiarity of artistic production no longer satisfies our highest needs thought and reflection have surpassed art the beautiful he goes on to say that the reason generally given for this is the prevalence of material and political interests but the true reason is the inferiority in degree of art as compared with pure thought art is dead and philosophy can therefore supply its complete biography hegel's vorlesungen über aesthetik amounts therefore to a funeral oration upon art romanticism and metaphysical idealism had placed art sometimes above the clouds sometimes within them and believing that it was no good there to any one hegel provided a decent burial nothing perhaps better shows how well this fantastic conception of art suited the spirit of the time than the fact that even the adversaries of schelling solger and hegel either admit agreement with that conception or find themselves involuntarily in agreement with it while believing themselves to be very remote they too are mystical aestheticians we all know with what virulence arthur schopenhauer attacked and combated schelling hegel and the charlatans and professors who had divided among them the inheritance of kant well schopenhauer's theory of art starts just like hegel's from the difference between the abstract and the concrete concept which is the idea schopenhauer's ideas are the platonic ideas although in the form which he gives them they have a nearer resemblance to the ideas of schelling than to the idea of hegel schopenhauer takes much trouble to differentiate his ideas from intellectual concepts he calls the idea unity which has become plurality by means of space and time it is the form of our intuitive apperception the concept is on the contrary unity extracted from plurality by means of abstraction which is an act of our intellect the concept may be called unitas post rem the idea unitas ante rem the origin of this physiological illusion of the ideas or types of things is always to be found in the changing of the imperial classifications created for their own purposes by the natural sciences into living realities thus each art has for its sphere a specific category of ideas architecture and its derivatives gardening and strange to say landscape painting is included with it sculpture and animal painting historical painting and the higher forms of sculpture etc all possess their special ideas poetry's chief object is man as idea music on the contrary does not belong to the hierarchy of the other arts schelling has looked upon music as expressing the rhythm of the universe itself for schopenhauer music does not express ideas but the will itself the analogies between music and the world between fundamental notes and crude matter between the scale and the scale of species between melody and conscience will lead schopenhauer to the conclusion that music is not only an arithmetic as it appears to leibniz but indeed a metaphysic the occult metaphysical exercise of a soul not knowing that it philosophizes for schopenhauer as for his idealist predecessors art is beatific it is the flower of life he who is plunged in artistic contemplation ceases to be an individual he is the conscious subject pure freed from will from pain and from time 
yet in schopenhauer's system exist elements for a better and more profound treatment of the problem of art he could sometimes show himself to be a lucid and acute analyst for instance he continually remarks that the categories of space and time are not applicable to art but only the general form of representation he might have deduced from this that art is the most immediate not the most lofty grade of consciousness since it precedes even the ordinary perceptions of space and time vico had already observed that this freeing oneself from ordinary perception this dwelling in imagination does not really mean an ascent to the level of the platonic ideas but on the contrary a redescending to the sphere of immediate intuition a return to childhood on the other hand schopenhauer had begun to submit the kantian categories to impartial criticism and finding the two forms of intuition insufficient added a third causality he also drew comparisons between art and history and was more successful here than the idealist excogitators of a philosophy of history schopenhauer rightly saw that history was irreducible to concepts that it is the contemplation of the individual and therefore not a science having proceeded thus far he might have gone farther and realized that the material of history is always the particular in its particularity that of art what is and always is identical but he preferred to execute a variation on the general motive that was in fashion at this time the fashion of the day it rules in philosophy as elsewhere and we are now able to see the most rigid and arid of analysts the leader of the so-called realist school or school of exact science in germany in the nineteenth century plunge headlong into aesthetic mysticism g f herbart eighteen thirteen begins his aesthetic by freeing it from the discredit attaching to metaphysic and to psychology he declares that the only true way of understanding art is to study particular examples of the beautiful and to note what they reveal as to its essence we shall now see what came of herbart's analysis of these examples of beauty and how far he succeeded in remaining free of metaphysic for herbart beauty consists of relations the science of aesthetic consists of an enumeration of all the fundamental relations between colors lines tones thoughts and will but for him these relations are not empirical or physiological they cannot therefore be studied in a laboratory because thought and the will form a part of them and these belong as much to ethics as to the external world but herbart explicitly states that no true beauty is sensible although sensation may and does often precede and follow the intuition of beauty there is a profound distinction between the beautiful and the agreeable or pleasant the latter does not require a representation while the former consists in representations of relations which are immediately followed by a judgment expressing unconditional approval thus the merely pleasurable becomes more and more indifferent but the beautiful appears always as of more and more permanent value the judgment of taste is universal eternal immutable the complete representation of the same relations always carries with it the same judgment for herbart aesthetic judgments are the general class containing the subclass of ethical judgments the five ethical ideas of internal liberty of perfection of benevolence of equity and of justice are five aesthetic ideas or better they are aesthetic concepts applied to the will in its relations herbart looked upon art as a complex fact composed of an external element possessing logical or psychological value the content and of a true aesthetic element which is the form entertainment instruction and pleasure of all sorts are mingled with the beautiful in order to obtain favor for the work in question the aesthetic judgment calm and serene in itself may be accompanied by all sorts of physic emotions foreign to it but the content is always transitory relative subject to moral laws and judged by them the form alone is perennial absolute and free the true catharsis can only be effected by separating the form from the content concrete art may be the sum of two values but the aesthetic fact is form alone for those capable of penetrating beneath appearances the aesthetic doctrines of herbart and kant will appear very similar herbart is notable as insisting in the manner of kant on the distinction between free and adherent beauty or adornment as sensuous stimulant on the existence of pure beauty object of necessary and universal judgments 
and on a certain mingling of ethic with his aesthetic theory herbart indeed called himself a kantian but of the year eighteen twenty eight kant's aesthetic theory though it be full of errors yet is rich in fruitful suggestions kant belongs to a period when philosophy is still young and pliant herbart came later and is dry and one-sided the romantics and the metaphysical idealists had unified the theory of the beautiful and of art herbart restored the old duality and mechanism and gave us an absurd unfruitful form of mysticism void of all artistic inspiration herbart may be said to have taken all there was of false in the thought of kant and to have made it into a system the beginning of the nineteenth century in germany is notable for the great number of philosophical theories and of counter theories broached and rapidly discussed before being discarded none of the most prominent names in the period belong to philosophers of first-rate importance though they made so much stir in their day the thought of friedrich schleiermacher was obscured and misunderstood amid those crowding mediocrities yet it is perhaps the most interesting and the most noteworthy of the period schleiermacher looked upon aesthetic as an altogether modern form of thought he perceived a profound difference between the poetics of aristotle not yet freed from empirical precepts and the tentative of baumgarten in the eighteenth century he praised kant as having been the first to include aesthetic among the philosophical disciplines he admitted that with hegel it had attained to the highest pinnacle being connected with religion and with philosophy and almost placed upon their level but he was dissatisfied with the absurdity of the attempt made by followers of baumgarten to construct a science or theory of sensuous pleasure he disapproved of kant's view of taste as being the principle of aesthetic of fitch's art as moral teaching and of the vague conception of the beautiful as the centre of aesthetic he approved of schiller's marking of the moment of spontaneity in productive art and he praised schelling for having drawn attention to the figurative arts as being less liable than poetry to be diverted to false and illusory moralistic ends before he begins the study of the place due to the artistic activity in ethic he carefully excludes from the study of aesthetic all practical rules which being empirical are incapable of scientific demonstration for schleiermacher the sphere of ethic included the whole philosophy of the spirit in addition to morality these are the two forms of human activity that which like logic is the same in all men and is called activity of identity and the activity of difference or individuality there are activities which like art are internal or immanent and individual and others which are external or practical the true work of art is the internal picture measure is what differentiates the artist's portrayal of anger on the stage and the anger of a really angry man truth is not sought in poetry or if it be sought there it is truth of an altogether different kind the truth of poetry lies in coherent presentation likeness to a model does not compose the merit of the picture not the smallest amount of knowledge comes from art which expresses only the truth of a particular consciousness art has for its field the immediate consciousness of self which must be carefully distinguished from the thought of the ego this last is the consciousness of identity in the diversity of moments as they pass the immediate consciousness of self is the diversity itself of the moments of which we should be aware for life is nothing but the development of consciousness in this field art has sometimes been confused with two facts which accompany it there these are sentient consciousness that is the feelings of pleasure and of pain and religion schleiermacher here alludes to the sensualistic aestheticians of the eighteenth century and to hegel who had almost identified art and religion he refutes both points of view by pointing out that sentient pleasure and religious sentiment however different they may be from other points of view are yet both determined by an objective fact while art on the contrary is free productivity dream is the best parallel and proof of this free productivity all the essential elements of art are found in dream which is the result of free thoughts and of sensible intuitions consisting simply of images but dream as compared with art is chaotic when measure and order is established in dream it becomes art thoughts and images are alike essential to art 
and to both is necessary ponderation, reflection, measure, and unity, because otherwise every image would be confused with every other image. Thus the moments of inspiration and of ponderation are both necessary to art. Schleiermacher's thought, so firm and lucid up to this point, begins to become less secure, with the discussion of typicity and the extent to which the artist should follow nature. He says that ideal figures, which nature would give, were she not impeded by external obstacles, are the products of art. He notes that when the artist represents something really given, such as a portrait or a landscape, he renounces freedom of production and adheres to the real. In the artist is a double tendency, toward the perfection of the type and toward the representation of natural reality. He should not fall into the abstraction of the type, nor into insignificance of empirical reality. Schleiermacher feels all the difficulty of such a problem as whether there be one or several ideals of the human figure. This problem may be transferred to the sphere of art, and we may ask whether the poet is to represent only the ideal, or whether he should also deal with those obstacles to it that impede nature in her efforts to attain. Both views contain half the truth. To art belongs the representation of the ideal as of the real, of the subjective and the objective alike. The representation of the comic, that is, of the anti-ideal and the imperfect ideal, belongs to the domain of art. For the human form, both morally and physically, oscillates between the ideal and caricature. He arrives at a most important definition as to the independence of art in respect to morality. The nature of art, as of philosophic speculation, excludes moral and practical effects. Therefore, there is no other difference between works of art than their respective artistic perfection, Vollkommenheit in der Kunst. If we could correctly predict volitional aspects in respect of works of art, then we should find ourselves admiring only those works which stimulated the will, and there would thus be established a difference of valuation independent of artistic perfection. The true work of art depends upon the degree of perfection with which the external in it agrees with the internal. Schleiermacher rightly combats Schiller's view that art is in any sense a game. That, he says, is the view held by mere men of business, to whom business alone is serious. But artistic activity is universal, and a man completely deprived of it unthinkable, although the difference here between man and man is gigantic, ranging from the simple desire to taste of art to the effective tasting of it, and from this, by infinite gradations, to productive genius. The regrettable fact that Schleiermacher's thought has reached us only in an imperfect form may account for certain of its defects, such as his failure to eliminate aesthetic classes and types, his retention of a certain residue of abstract formalism, his definition of art as the activity of difference. Had he better defined the moment of artistic reproduction, realized the possibility of tasting the art of various times and of other nations, and examined the true relation of art to science, he would have seen that this difference is merely empirical and to be surmounted. He failed also to recognize the identity of the aesthetic activity with language as the base of all other theoretic activity. But Schleiermacher's merits far outweigh these defects. He removed from aesthetic its imperativistic character. He distinguished a form of thought different from logical thought. He attributed to our science a non-metaphysical, anthropological character. He denied the concept of the beautiful, substituting for it artistic perfection, and maintaining the aesthetic equality of a small, with a great work of art. He looked upon the aesthetic fact as an exclusively human productivity. Thus Schleiermacher, the theologian, in this period of metaphysical orgy, of rapidly constructed and as rapidly destroyed systems, perceived, with the greatest philosophical acumen, what is really characteristic of art, and distinguished its properties and relations. Even where he fails to see clearly his way, he never abandons analysis for mere guesswork. Schleiermacher thus exploring the obscure religion of the immediate consciousness, or of the aesthetic fact, can almost be heard crying out to his strained contemporaries, Hic Rhodus, he Salta. 
Speculation upon the origin and nature of language was rife at this time in Germany. Many theories were put forward, among the most curious being that of Stelling, who held language and mythology to be the product of a pre-human consciousness, allegorically expressed as the diabolic suggestions which had precipitated the ego from the infinite to the finite. Even Wilhelm von Humboldt was unable to free himself altogether from the intellectualistic prejudice of the substantial identity and the merely historical and accidental diversity of logical thought and language. He speaks of a perfect language, broken up and diminished with the lesser capacities of lesser peoples. He believed that language is sometimes standing outside the individual, independent of him, and capable of being revived by use. But there were two men in Humboldt, an old man and a young one. The latter was always suggesting that language should be looked upon as a living, not as a dead thing, as an activity, not as a word. This duality of thought sometimes makes his writing difficult and obscure. Although he speaks of an internal form of speech, he fails to identify this with art as expression. The reason is that he looks upon the word in too unilateral a manner, as a means of developing logical thought, and his ideas of aesthetic are too vague and too inexact to enable him to discover their identity. Despite his perception of the profound truth that poetry precedes prose, Humboldt gives grounds for doubt as to whether he had clearly recognized and firmly grasped the fact that language is always poetry, and that prose, science, is a distinction, not of aesthetic form, but of content, that is, of logical form. Steinthal, the greatest follower of Humboldt, solved his master's contradictions, and in 1855 sustained successfully against the Hegelian Becker the thesis that words are necessary for thought. He pointed to the deaf mute with his signs, to the mathematician with his formulae, to the Chinese language, where the figurative portion is an essential of speech, and declared that Becker was wrong in believing that the Sanskrit language was derived from twelve cardinal concepts. He showed effectively that the concept and the word, the logical judgment and the proposition, are not comparable. The proposition is not a judgment, but the representation of a judgment, and all propositions do not represent logical judgments. Several judgments can be expressed with one proposition. The logical divisions of judgments, the relations of concepts, have no correspondence in the grammatical divisions of propositions. If we speak of a logical form of the proposition, we fall into a contradiction in terms no less complete than his who should speak of the angle of a circle or the periphery of a triangle. He who speaks, in so far as he speaks, has not thoughts, but language. When Steinthal had several times solemnly proclaimed the independence of language as regards logic, and that it produces its forms in complete autonomy, he proceeded to seek the origin of language, recognizing with Humboldt that the question of its origin is the same as that of its nature. Language, he said, belongs to the great class of reflex movements, but this only shows one side of it, not its true nature. Animals, like men, have reflex actions and sensations, though nature enters the animal by force, takes it by assault, conquers and enslaves it. With man is born language, because he is resistance to nature, governance of his own body and liberty. Language is liberation. Even today we feel that our soul becomes lighter and frees itself from a weight when we speak. Man, before he attains to speech, must be conceived of as accompanying all his sensations with bodily movements, mimetic attitudes, gestures, and particularly with articulate sounds. What is still lacking to him that he may attain speech? The connection between reflex movements of the body and the state of the soul. If his sentient consciousness be already consciousness, then he lacks the consciousness of a consciousness. If it be already intuition, then he lacks the intuition of intuition. In sum, he lacks the internal form of language. With this comes speech, which forms the connection. Man does not choose the sound of his speech. This is given to him, and he adopts it instinctively. When we have accorded to Steinthal the great merit of having rendered coherent the ideas of Humboldt, and of having clearly separated linguistic from logical thought, we must note that he too failed to perceive the identity of the internal form of language 
or intuition of the intuition as he called it with the aesthetic imagination herbert's psychology to which steinthal adhered did not afford him any means for this identification herbart separated logic from psychology calling it a normative science he failed to discern the exact limits between feeling and spiritual formation psyche or soul and spirit and to see that one of these spiritual forms is logical thought or activity which is not a code of laws imposed from without for herbart aesthetic as we know was a code of beautiful formal relations thus steinthal following herbart in psychology was bound to look upon art as a beautifying of thought linguistic as the science of speech rhetoric and aesthetic as the science of beautiful speech steinthal never realized that to speak is to speak well or beautifully under penalty of not speaking and that the revolution which he and humboldt had effected in the conception of language must inevitably react upon and transform poetic rhetoric and aesthetic thus despite so many efforts of conscientious analysis on the part of humboldt and of steinthal the unity of language and of poetry and the identification of the science of language and the science of poetry still found its least imperfect expression in the prophetic aphorisms of vico the philosophical movement in germany from the last quarter of the eighteenth century to the first half of the nineteenth notwithstanding its many errors is yet so notable and so imposing with the philosophers already considered as to merit the first place in the european thought of that period this is even more the case as regards aesthetic than as regards philosophy in general end of section twenty three section twenty four of aesthetic as science of expression and general linguistic this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce. Translated by Douglas Ainsley, 1865-1948. Historical Summary, Part 6 france was the prey of condillac's sensualism and therefore incapable of duly appreciating the spiritual activity of art we hardly get a glimpse of wickelman's transcendental spiritualism in quatamere de quincey and the frigid academics of victor cousin were easily surpassed by theodore joffre though he too failed of isolating the aesthetic fact french romanticism defined literature as the expression of society admired under german influence the grotesque and the characteristic declared the independence of art in the formula of art for art's sake but did not succeed in surpassing philosophically the old doctrine of the imitation of nature f schlegel and solger indeed were largely responsible for the romantic movement in france schlegel with his belief in the characteristic or interesting as the principle of modern art which led him to admire the cruel and the ugly solger with his dialectic arrangement whereby the finite or terrestrial element is absorbed and annihilated in the divine and thus becomes the tragic or vice versa and the result is the comic rosencrantz published in konigsberg an aesthetic of the ugly and the works of vischer and zeising abound in subtleness relating to the idea and to its expression in the beautiful and sublime these writers conceived of the idea of the night pure beautiful constrained to abandon his tranquil ease through the machinations of the ugly the ugly leads him into all sorts of disagreeable adventures from all of which he eventually emerges victorious the sublime the comic the humorous and so on are his marengo austerlitz and jenna another version of their night's adventures might be described as his conquest by his enemies but at the moment of conquest he transforms and irradiates his conquerors to such a mediocre and artificial mythology led the much elaborated theory of the modifications of the beautiful in england the associationist psychology continued to hold sway and showed with dugald stewart's miserable attempt 
at establishing two forms of association its incapacity to rise to the conception of the imagination with the poet coleridge england also showed the influence of german thought and coleridge elaborated with wordsworth a more correct conception of poetry and of its difference from science but the most notable contribution in english at that period came from another poet p b shelley whose defense of poetry contains profound though unsystematic views as to the distinction between reason and imagination prose and poetry on primitive language and on the poetic power of objectification in italy francesco de sanctis gave magnificent expression to the independence of art he taught literature in naples from eighteen thirty eight to eighteen forty eight in turin and zurich from eighteen fifty to eighteen sixty and after eighteen seventy he was a professor in the university of naples historia della literatura italiana is a classic and in it and in monographs on individual writers he exposed his doctrines prompted by natural love of speculation he began to examine the old grammarians and rhetoricians with a view to systematize them but very soon he proceeded to criticize and to surpass their theories the cold rules of reason did not find favor with him and he advised young men to go direct to the original works the philosophy of hegel began to penetrate italy and the study of vico was again taken up de sanctis translated the logic of hegel in prison where the bourbon government had thrown him for his liberalism bernard had begun his translation of the aesthetic of hegel and so completely in harmony was de sanctis that the thought of this master that he is said to have guessed from a study of the first volume what the unpublished volumes must contain and to have lectured upon them to his pupils traces of mystical idealism and of hegelianism persist even in his later works and the distinction which he always maintained between imagination and fancy certainly came to him from hegel and schelling he held fancy alone to be the true poetic faculty de sanctis absorbed all the juice of hegel but rejected the husks of his pedantry of his formalism of his a priority fancy for de sanctis was not the mystical transcendental apperception of the german philosophers but simply the faculty of poetic synthesis and creation opposed to the imagination which reunites details and always has something mechanical about it faith and poetry he used to say are not dead but transformed his criticism of hegel amounted in many places to the correction of hegel and as regards vico he is careful to point out that when in dealing with the homeric poems vico talks of generic types he is no longer the critic of art but the historian of civilization de sanctis saw that artistically achilles must always be achilles never a force or an abstraction thus de sanctis succeeded in keeping himself free from the hegelian domination at a moment when hegel was the acknowledged master of speculation but his criticism extended also to other german aestheticians by a curious accident he found himself at zurich in the company of theodore vischer that ponderous hegelian who laughed disdainfully at the mention of poetry of music and of the decadent italian race de sanctis laughed at vischer's laughter wagner appeared to him a corrupter of music and nothing in the world more unesthetic than the aesthetic of theodore vischer his lectures on ariosto and petrarch before an international public at zurich were delivered with the desire of correcting the errors of these and of other german philosophers and learned men he gave his celebrated definitions of french and german critics the french critic does not indulge in theories one feels warmth of impression and sagacity of observation in his argument he never leaves the concrete he divines the quality of the writer's genius and the quality of his work and studies the man in order to understand the writer 
his great fault is shown in substituting for criticism of the actual art work a historical criticism of the author and of his time for the german on the other hand there is nothing so simple that he does not contrive to distort and to confuse it he collects shadows around him from which shoot vivid rays he laboriously brings to birth that morsel of truth which he has within him he would seize and define what is most fugitive and impalpable in a work of art although nobody talks so much of life as he does yet no one so much delights in decomposing and generalizing it having thus destroyed the particular he is able to show you as the result of this process final in appearance but in reality preconceived and a priorist one measurement for all feet one garment for all bodies about this time he studied schopenhauer who was then becoming the fashion schopenhauer said of this criticism of de sanctis that italian has absorbed me succum et sanguinum what weight did he attach to schopenhauer's much valued writings of art having exposed the theory of ideas he barely refers to the third he barely refers to the third volume which contains an exaggerated theory of aesthetic in his criticism of petrarch de sanctis finally broke with metaphysical aesthetic saying of hegel's school that it believed the beautiful to become art when it surpassed form and revealed the concept of pure idea this theory and the subtleties derived from it far from characterizing art represent its contrary the impotent velity for art which cannot slay abstractions and come in contact with life de sanctus held that outside the domain of art all is shapeless the ugly is of the domain of art if art give it form is there anything more beautiful than iago if he be looked upon merely as a contrast to othello then we are in the position of those who looked upon the stars as placed where they are to serve as candles for the earth form was for de sanctus the word which should be inscribed over the entrance to the temple of art in the work of art are form and content but the latter is no longer chaotic the artist has given to it a new value has enriched it with the gift of his own personality but if the content has not been assimilated and made his own by the artist then the work lacks generative power it is of no value as art or literature though as history or scientific document its value may be great the gods of homer's iliad are dead but the iliad remains guelph and ghibelline have disappeared from italy not so the divine comedy which is as vigorous today as when dante first took pen in hand thus de sanctus held firmly to the independence of art but he did not accept the formula of art for art's sake in so far as it meant separation of the artist from life mutilation of the content art reduced to mere dexterity for de sanctus form was identical with imagination with the artist's power of expressing or representing his artistic vision this much must be admitted by his critics but he never attained to a clear definition of art his theory of aesthetic always remained a sketch wonderful indeed but not clearly developed and deduced the reason for this was de sanctus love of the concrete no sooner had he attained from general ideas a sufficient clarity of vision for his own purposes then he plunged again into the concrete and particular he did not confine his activity to literature but was active also in politics and in the prosecution and encouragement of historical studies as a critic of literature de sanctus is far superior to st beuve lessing macaulay or taine flaubert's genial intuition adumbrated what de sanctus achieved in one of his letters to george sands flaubert speaks of the lack of an artistic critic in la harpe's time criticism was grammatical in the time of st beuve and of taine it is historical they analyze with great subtlety the historical environment in which the work appeared and the causes which have produced it but the unconscious element in poetry whence does it come 
and composition and style and the point of view of the author of all that they never speak for such a critic great imagination and great goodness are necessary i mean an ever-ready faculty of enthusiasm and then taste a quality so rare even among the best that it is never mentioned de sanctus alone fulfilled the conditions of flaubert and italy has in his writings a looking-glass for her literature unequalled by any other country but with de sanctus the philosopher of art the aesthetician is not so great as the critic of literature the one is accessory to the other and his use of aesthetic terminology is so inconstant that a lack of clearness of thought might be found in his work by any one who had not studied it with care but his want of system is more than compensated by his vitality by his constant citation of actual works and by his intuition of the truth which never abandon him his writings bear the further charm of suggesting new kingdoms to conquer new minds of richness to explore while the cry down with metaphysic was resounding in germany and a furious reaction had set in against the sort of walpurgisnacht to which the later hegelians had reduced science and history the pupils of herbart came forward and with an insinuating air they seemed to say what is this why it is a rebellion against metaphysic the very thing our master wished for and tried to achieve half a century ago but here we are his heirs and successors and we want to be your allies an understanding between us will be easy our metaphysic is in agreement with the atomic theory our psychology with mechanicism our ethic and aesthetic with hedonism herbart who died in eighteen forty one would probably have disdained and rejected his followers who thus courted popularity and cheapened metaphysic putting a literal interpretation on his realities his ideas and representations and upon all his most lofty excogitations the protagonist of these neo herbartians was robert zimmerman he constructed his system of aesthetic out of herbart whom he perverted to his own uses and even employed the much abused hegelian dialectic in order to introduce modifications of the beautiful into pure beauty the beautiful he said is a model which possesses greatness fullness order correction and definite compensation beauty appears to us in a characteristic form as a copy of this model Vishner, against whom was directed this work of zimmermann found it easy to reply he ridiculed zimmermann's meaning of the symbol as the object around which are clustered beautiful forms does an artist paint a fox simply that he may depict an object of animal in nature no no my dear sir far from it this fox is a symbol because the painter here employs lines and colors in order to express something different from the lines and colors you think i am a fox cries the painted animal you are mightily mistaken i am on the contrary a portmanteau an exhibition by the painter of red white gray and yellow tints Vischer also made fun of Zimmermann's enthusiasm for the aesthetic value of the sense of touch. What joy it must be to touch the back of the bust of Hercules in repose, to stroke the sinuous limbs of the Venus of Milo, or of the fawn of Barberini, must give a pleasure to the hand equal to that of the ear as it listens to the puissant figures of Bach or to the suave melodies of Mozart vischer defined the formal aesthetic of zimmermann as a queer mixture of mysticism and mathematic lotz in common with the great majority of thinkers was dissatisfied with zimmermann but could only oppose his formalism with a variety of the old mystical aesthetic who he asked could believe that the human form pleases only by its external proportions regardless of the spirit within art like beauty should enclose the world of values in the world of forms this struggle between the aesthetic of the content and the aesthetic of the form 
attained its greatest height in Germany between 1860 and 1870, with Zimmermann, Vischer, and Lotz as protagonists. These writers were followed by J. Schmidt, who in 1875 ventured to say that both Lotz and Zimmermann had failed to see that the problem of aesthetic concerned not the beauty or ugliness of the content or of the form as mathematical relations, but their representation. Costlin, who erected an immense artificial structure with the materials of his predecessors modified. Schassler, who is interesting as having converted the old Vischer to his thesis of the importance of the ugly, as introducing modifications into the beautiful and being the principle of movement there. Vischer confesses that at one time he had followed the Hegelian method and believed that in the essence of beauty is born a disquietude, a fermentation, a struggle. The idea conquers, hurls the image into the unlimited, and the sublime is born. But the image offended in its finitude, declares war upon the idea, and the cosmic appears. Thus the fight is finished and the beautiful returns to itself, as the result of these struggles. But now, he says, Schausler has persuaded him that the ugly is the leaven which is necessary to all the special forms of the beautiful. E. von Hartmann is in close relation to Schausler. His aesthetic, 1890, also makes great use of the ugly. Since he insists upon appearance as a necessary characteristic of the beautiful, he considers himself justified in calling his theory concrete idealism. Hartmann considers himself in opposition to the formalism of Herbart, inasmuch as he insists upon the idea as an indispensable and determining element of beauty. Beauty, he says, is truth, but it is not historical truth, nor scientific, nor reflective truth. It is metaphysical and ideal. Beauty is the prophet of idealistic truth in an age without faith, hating metaphysic, and acknowledging only realistic truth. Aesthetic truth is without method and without control. It leaps at once from the subjective appearance to the essence of the ideal but in compensation for this it possesses the fascination of conviction, which immediate intuition alone possesses. The higher philosophy rises, the less need has she of passing through the world of the senses and of science. She approaches ever more nearly to art. Thus, philosophy starts on the voyage to the ideal, like Bedecker's traveler, without too much baggage. In the beautiful is imminent logicity the microcosmic idea, the unconscious. By means of the unconscious, the process of intellectual intuition takes place in it. The beautiful is a mystery, because its root is in the unconscious. No philosopher has ever made so great a use of the ugly as Hartmann. He divides beauty into grades, of which the one below is ugly as compared with that above it. He begins with the mathematical superior to the sensibility agreeable, which is unconscious, thence to formal beauty of the second order, the dynamically agreeable, to formal beauty of the third order, the passive theological. To this degree belong utensils and language, which in Hartmann's view is a dead thing, inspired with seeming life only at the moment of use. Such things did the philosopher of the unconscious dared to print in the country of a Humboldt during the lifetime of a Steinthal. He proceeds in his last of things beautiful with formal beauty of the fourth degree, which is the active or living theological, with the fifth, which is that of species. Finally, he reaches concrete beauty or the individual microcosm, the highest of all, because the individual idea is superior to the specific and is beauty no longer formal, but of content. All these degrees of beauty are, as has been said, connected with one another by means of the ugly, and even in the highest degree, which has nothing superior to it, the ugly continues its office of beneficent titillation. The outcome of this ultimate phase is the famous theory of the modifications of the beautiful. 
none of these modifications can occur without a struggle save the sublime and the graceful which appear without conflict at the side of supreme beauty hartman gives four instances the solution is either imminent logical transcendental or combined the idyllic the melancholy the sad the glad the elegiac are instances of the imminent solution the comic in all its forms is the logical solution the tragic is the transcendental solution the combined form is found in the humorous the tragic comic when none of these solutions is possible we have the ugly and when an ugliness of content is expressed by a formal ugliness we have the maximum of ugliness the true aesthetic devil hartmann is the last noteworthy representative of the german metaphysical school his works are gigantic in size and appear formidable but if one be not afraid of giants and venture to approach near one finds nothing but a big morgante full of the most commonplace prejudices quite easily killed with the bite of a crab during this period aesthetic had few representatives in other countries the famous conference of the academy of moral and political sciences held in paris in eighteen fifty seven gave to the world the science de bleu of l'eveque no one is interested in it now but it is amusing to note that l'eveque announced himself to be a disciple of plato and went on to attribute eight characteristics to the beautiful these he discovered by closely examining the lily no wonder he was crowned with laurels he proved his wonderful theory by instancing a child playing with its mother a symphony of beethoven and the life of socrates one of his colleagues who could not resist making fun of his learned friend remarked that he would be glad to know what part was played in the life of a philosopher by the normal vivacity of color thus german theory made no way in france and england proved even more refractory j ruskin showed a poverty an incoherence and a lack of system in respect to aesthetic which puts him almost out of court his was the very reverse of the philosophic temperament his pages of brilliant prose contain his own dreams and caprices they are the work of an artist and should be enjoyed as such being without any value for philosophy his theoretic faculty of the beautiful which he held to be distinct alike from the intelligence and from feeling is connected with his belief in beauty as a revelation of the divine intentions the seal which god sets upon his works thus the natural beauty which is perceived by the pure heart when contemplating some object untouched by the hand of man is far superior to the work of the artist ruskin was too little capable of analysis to understand the complicated psychological aesthetic process taking place within him as he contemplated some streamlet or the nest of some small bird at naples flourished between eighteen sixty one and eighteen eighty four antonio tari who kept himself in touch with the movement of german thought and followed the german idealists in placing aesthetic in a sort of middle kingdom a temperate zone between the glacial inhabited by the esquimo of thought and the torrid dwelt in by the giants of action he dethroned the beautiful and put aesthetic in its place for the beautiful is but the first moment the later ones are the comic the humorous and the dramatic his fertile imagination found metaphors and similes in everything for instance he called the goat the devil opposed to the lamb jesus his remarks on men and women are full of quaint fancies he granted to women grace but not beauty which resides in equilibrium this is proved by her falling down so easily when she walks by her bow legs which have to support her wide hips made for gestation by her narrow shoulders and her opulent breast she is therefore a creature altogether devoid of equilibrium i wish it were possible to record more of the sayings of the excellent tari 
the last joyous priest of an arbitrary aesthetic source of confusion end of section twenty four chapter twenty five of aesthetic as science of expression and general linguistic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce. Translated by Douglas Ainsley, 1865-1948. Historical Summary, Part 7. The ground lost to the German school of metaphysicians was occupied during the second half of the 19th century by the evolutionary and positivist metaphysicians, of whom Herbert Spencer is the most notable representative. The peculiarity of this school lies in repeating at second or third hand certain idealist views, deprived of the element of pure philosophy, given to them by a Schelling or a Hegel, and in substituting a quantity of minute facts and anecdotes with a view to providing the positivist varnish. These theories are dear to vulgar minds because they correspond to inveterate religious beliefs, and the luster of the varnish explains the good fortune of Spencerian positivism in our time. Another notable trait of this school is its barbaric contempt for history, especially for the history of philosophy, and its consequent lack of all link with the series composed of the secular efforts of so many thinkers. Without this link, there can be no fruitful labor and no possibility of progress. Spencer is colossal in his ignorance of all that has been written or thought on the subject of aesthetic, to limit ourselves to this branch alone. He actually begins his work in the philosophy of style with these words. No one, I believe, has ever produced a complete theory of the art of writing. This, in 1852. He begins his chapter on aesthetic feelings in The Principle of Psychology by admitting that he has heard of the observation made by a German author, whose name he forgets, Schiller, on the connection between art and play. Had Spencer's remarks on aesthetic been written in the 18th century, they might have occupied a humble place among the first rude attempts at aesthetic speculation. But appearing in the 19th century, they are without value, as the little of value they contain had been long said by others. In his Principles of Psychology, Spencer looks upon aesthetic feelings as arising from the discharge of this exuberant energy of the organism. This he divides into degrees, and believes that we attain complete enjoyment when these degrees are all working satisfactorily, each on its own plane, and when what is painful in excessive activity has been avoided. His degrees are sensation, sensation accompanied by representative elements, perception accompanied by more complex elements of representation than emotion, and that state of consciousness which surpasses sensations and perceptions. But Spencer has no suspicion of what art really is. His views oscillate between sensualism and moralism, and he sees little in the whole art of antiquity, of the Middle Ages, or of modern times, which can be looked upon as otherwise than imperfect. The physiology of aesthetics has also had its votaries in Great Britain, among whom may be mentioned J. Sully, A. Bain, and Allen. These at any rate show some knowledge of the concrete fact of art. Allen harks back to the old distinction between necessary and vital activities and superfluous activities, and gives a physiological definition which may be read in his Physiological Aesthetics. More recent writers also look upon the physiological fact as the cause of the pleasure of art, but for them it does not alone depend upon the visual organ and the muscular phenomena associated with it, but also on the participation of some of the most important bodily functions, such as respiration, circulation, equilibrium, intimate muscular accommodation. They believe that art owes its origin to the pleasure that some prehistoric man must have experienced in breathing regularly, without having to readapt his organs, when he traced for the first time on a bone or on clay regular lines separated by regular intervals. A similar order of the physico-aesthetic researches has been made in Germany under the auspices of Helmholtz, Brucke, and Stumpf. But these writers have succeeded better than the above mentioned by restricting themselves to the fields of optic and acoustic, and have supplied information as to the physical processes of artistic technique and as to the pleasure of visual and auditive impressions, without attempting to melt aesthetic into physic, or to deprive the former of its spiritual character. They have even occasionally indicated the difference between the two kinds of research. Even the degenerate Herbardians, converting the metaphysical forms of their master into physiological phenomenon, made soft eyes at the new sensualists and the aestheticophysiologists. The natural sciences have become in our day a sort of superstition, allied to a certain, perhaps unconscious, hypocrisy. 
not only have chemical physical and physiological laboratories become a sort of sibylline grots where resound the most extraordinary questions about everything that can interest the spirit of man but even those who really do prosecute their researches with the old inevitable method of internal observation have been unable to free themselves from the illusion that they are on the contrary employing the method of the natural sciences hippolyte taint's philosophy of art represents such an illusion he declares that when we have studied the diverse manifestations of art in all peoples and at all epochs we shall then possess a complete aesthetic such an aesthetic would be a sort of botany applied to the works of men this mode of study would provide moral science with a basis equally as sure as that which the natural sciences already possess taine then proceeds to define art without regard to the natural sciences by analyzing like a simple mortal what passes in the human soul when brought face to face with a work of art but what analysis and what definitions art he says is imitation but of a sort that tries to express an essential characteristic thus the principal characteristic of a lion is to be a great carnivore and we observe this characteristic in all its limbs holland has for essential characteristic that of being a land formed of alluvial soil now without staying to consider these two remarkable instances let us ask what is this essential characteristic of tain it is the same as the ideas types or concepts that the old aesthetic teaching assigned to art as its object Taine himself removes all doubt as to this by saying that this characteristic is what philosophers call the essence of things and for that reason they declare that the purpose of art is to manifest things he declares that he will not employ the word essence which is technical but he accepts and employs the thought that the word expresses he believes that there are two routes by which man can attain to the superior life science and art by the first he apprehends fundamental laws and causes and expresses them in abstract terms by the second he expresses these same laws and causes in a manner comprehensible to all by appealing to the heart and feeling as well as to the reason of man art is both superior and popular it makes manifest what is highest and makes it manifest to all that taint here falls into the old pedagogic theory of aesthetic is evident works of art are arranged for him in a scale of values as for the aesthetic metaphysicians he begins by declaring the absurdity of all judgment of taste a chacun son goût but he ends by declaring that personal taste is without value that we must establish a common measure before proceeding to praise or blame his scale of values is double or triple we must first fix the degree of importance of the characteristic that is the greater or less generality of the idea and the degree of good in it that is to say its greater or lesser moral value these he says are two degrees of the same thing strength seen from different sides we must also establish the degree of convergence of the effects that is the fullness of expression the harmony between the idea and the form this half moral half metaphysical exposition is accompanied with the usual protestations that the matter in hand is to be studied methodically analytically as the naturalist would study it that he will try to reach a law not a hymn as if these protestations could abolish the true nature of his thought taine actually went so far as to attempt dialectic solutions of works of art in the primitive period of Italian art, we find the soul without the body, Giotto. At the Renaissance, with Verrocchio in his school, we find the body without the soul. With Raphael in the 16th century, we find expression and anatomy and harmony, body and soul. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. With G. T. Fechner, we find the like protestations and the like procedure. He will study aesthetic inductively from beneath. He seeks clarity, not loftiness. Proceeding thus inductively, he discovers a long series of laws or principles of aesthetic, such as unity in variety, association in contrast, change in persistence, the golden mean, etc. He exhibits this chaos with delight at showing himself so much of a physiologist and so inconclusive. Then he proceeds to describe his experiments in aesthetics. These consist of attempts to decide, for instance, by methods of choice, which of certain rectangles of cardboard is the most agreeable, and which the most disagreeable, to a large number of people arbitrarily chosen. Naturally, these results do not agree with others obtained on other occasions. But Fechner knows that errors correct themselves, and triumphantly publishes long lists of these valuable experiments. He also communicates to us the shapes and measurements of a large number of pictures in museums, as compared with their respective subjects. Such are the experiments of physiological estheticians but fechner when he comes to define what beauty and art really are is like everyone else obliged to fall back upon introspection but his definition is trivial and his comparison of his three degrees of beauty to a family is simply grotesque in its naivete he terms this theory the eudemonistic theory and we are left wondering why when he had this theory all cut and dried in his mind he should all the same give himself the immense trouble of compiling his tables and of enumerating his laws and principles which do not agree with his theory 
Perhaps it was all a pastime to him, like playing at patience or collecting postage stamps. Yet another example of superstition in respect to the natural sciences is afforded by Ernest Gross. Gross abounds in contempt for what he calls speculative aesthetic, yet he desires a science of art, Kunstwissenschaft, which shall formulate its laws from those historical facts which have hitherto been collected. But Gross wishes us to complete the collection of historical evidence with ethnographical and prehistoric materials, for we cannot obtain really general laws of art from the exclusive study of cultivated peoples, just as a theory of reproduction exclusively based upon the form it takes with mammifers must necessarily be imperfect. He is, however, aware that the results of experiences among savages and prehistoric races do not alone suffice to furnish us with an equipment for such investigations as that concerning the nature of art, and like any ordinary mortal he feels obliged to interrogate, before starting, the spirit of man. He therefore proceeds to divine aesthetic on a priorist principles, which he remarks can be discarded when we shall have obtained the complete theory, in like manner with the scaffolding that has served for the erection of a house. Words, words, vain words. He proceeds to define aesthetic as the activity which in its development and result has the immediate value of feeling, and is therefore an end in itself. Art is the opposite of practice. The activity of games stands intermediate between the two, having also its end in its own activity. The aesthetic of Taine and Gross have been called sociological. Seeing that any true definition of sociology as a science is impossible, for it is composed of psychological elements which are forever varying, we do not delay to criticize the futile attempts at definition, but pass at once to the objective results attained by the sociologists. This superstition, like the naturalistic, takes various forms in practical life. We have for existence Prudhan, 1875, who would hark back to Platonic aesthetic, class the aesthetic activity among the merely sensual, and command the arts to further the cause of virtue, on pain of judicial proceedings in case of contumacy. But M. Gayou, is the most important of sociological estheticians. His works, published in Paris toward the end of the last century, and his posthumous work, entitled Les Problèmes des Esthétiques Contemporaines, substitute for the theory of play, that of life, and the posthumous work above mentioned makes it evident that by life he means social life. Art is the development of social sympathy, but the whole of art does not enter into sociology. Art has two objects, the production of agreeable sensations, colors, sounds, etc., and of phenomena of psychological introduction, which include ideas and feelings of a more complex nature than the foregoing, such as sympathy for the personages represented, interest, piety, indignation, etc. Thus art becomes the expression of life. Hence arise two tendencies, one for harmony, consonance, for all that delights the ear and eye, the other transforming life under the dominion of art. True genius is destined to balance these two tendencies, but the decadent and the unbalanced deprive art of its sympathetic end, setting aesthetic sympathy against human sympathy. If we translate this language into that with which we are by this time quite familiar, we shall see that Gaillau admits an art that is merely hedonistic, and places above it another art, also hedonistic, but serving the ends of morality. M. Nordeau wages war against the decadent and unbalanced in much the same manner as Gaillau. He assigns to art the function of re-establishing the integrity of life, so much broken up and specialized in our industrial civilization. He remarks that there is such a thing as art for art's sake, the simple expression of the internal states of the individual, but it is the art of the cave-dweller. C. Lombroso's theory of genius as denigration may be grouped with the naturalistic theories. His argument is in essence the following. Great mental efforts and total absorption in one dominant thought often produce physiological disorders or atrophy of important vital functions. Now these disorders often lead to madness, therefore genius may be identified with madness. This proof, from the particular to the general, does not follow that of traditional logic. But with Lombroso, Buckner, Nordeau, and the like, we have come to the boundary between spacious and vulgar error. They confuse scientific analysis with historical research. Such inquiries may have value for history, but they have none for aesthetic. Thus, too, A. Lang maintains that the doctrine of the origin of art as disinterested expression of the mimetic faculty is not confirmed in what we know of primitive art, which is rather decorative than expressive. But primitive art, which is a given fact to be interpreted, cannot ever become its own criterion of interpretation. The naturalistic misunderstanding has had a bad effect on linguistic researches, which have not been carried out on the lofty plane to which Humboldt and Steinthal had brought them. Max Müller is popular and exaggerated. He fails clearly to distinguish thought from logical thought, although in one place he remarks that the formation of names has a more intimate connection with wit than with judgment. 
He holds that the science of language is not historical, but natural, because language is not the invention of man, altogether ignoring the science of the spirit, philosophy, of which language is a part. For Max Muller, this natural sciences were the only sciences. The consciousness of the science of the spirit becomes ever more obscured, and we find the philologist W. D. Whitney combining Max Muller's miracles and maintaining the separability of thought and speech. With Hermann Paul, 1880, we have an awakening of Humboldt's spirit. Paul maintains that the origin of language is the speech of the individual man, and that a language has its origin every time it is spoken. Paul also showed the fallacies contained in the Volker psychology of Steinthal and Lazarus, demonstrating that there is no such thing as a collective soul, and that there is no language save that of the individual. W. Wundt, 1886, on the other hand, commits the error of connecting language with ethnopsychology and other non-existent sciences, and actually terms the glorious doctrine of Herder and of Humboldt, or theory of miracle, accusing them of mystical obscurity. Wundt confuses the question of the historical appearance of language with that of its internal nature and genesis. He looks upon the theory of evolution as having attained to its complete triumph in its application to organic nature in general, and especially to man. He has no suspicion whatever of the function of fancy and of the true relation between thought and expression, between expression in the naturalistic and expression in the spiritual and linguistic sense. He looks upon speech as a specially developed form of psychophysical vital manifestations of expressive animal movements. Language is developed continuously from such facts and thus is explained how, beyond the general concept of expressive movement, there is no specific quality which delimits language in a non-arbitrary manner. Thus the philosophy of Wundt reveals its weak side, showing itself incapable of understanding the spiritual nature of language and of art. In the ethic of the same author, aesthetic facts are presented as a mixture of logical and ethical elements, a special normative aesthetic science is denied, and aesthetic is merged in logic and ethic. The neocritical and neo-Kantian movement in thought was not able to maintain the concept of the spirit against the hedonistic, moralistic, and psychological views of aesthetic, in vogue from about the middle of last century. Neocriticism inherited from Kant his view as to the slight importance of the creative imagination, and appears indeed to have been ignorant of any form of knowledge other than the intellective. Kirchman, 1868, was one of the early adherents to the psychological aesthetic, defining the beautiful as the idealized image of pleasure, the ugly as that of pain. For him, the aesthetic fact is the idealized image of the real. Failing to apprehend the true nature of the aesthetic fact, Kirchman invented a new psychological category of ideal or apparent feelings, which he thought were attenuated images from those of real life. The aged Theodore Fisher describes aesthetic in his autocriticism as the union of mimetic and harmony, and the beautiful as the harmony of the universe, which is never realized in fact because it is infinite. When we think to grasp the beautiful, we experience that exquisite illusion which is the aesthetic fact. Robert Fisher, son of the foregoing, introduced the word Einfühlung to express the vitality which he believed that man inspired into things with the help of the aesthetic process. E. Seaback and M. Dees, the former writing in 1875, the latter in 1892, unite a certain amount of idealistic influence derived from Kant and Herbert with the merely empirical and psychological views that have of late been the fashion. Dees, for instance, would explain the artistic function as the ideal of feeling, placing it parallel to science, the ideal of thought, morality, the idea of will and religion, the ideal of the personality. But this ideal of feeling escapes definition, and we see that these writers have not had the courage of their ideas. They have not dared to push their thought to its logical conclusion. The merely psychological and associationist view finds in Theodore Lips its chief exponent. He criticizes and rejects a series of aesthetic theories, such as those of play, of pleasure, of art as recognition of real life, even if disagreeable, of emotionality, of syncretism, which attaches to art a number of other ends, in addition to those of play and pleasure. The theory of Lips does not differ very greatly from that of Geoffroy, for he assumes that artistic beauty is the sympathetic. Our ego, transplanted, objectified, and recognized in others, is the object of sympathy. We feel ourselves in others and others in us. Thus the aesthetic pleasure is entirely composed of sympathy. This extends even to the pleasure derived from architecture, geometrical forms, etc. Whenever we meet with a positive element of human personality, we experience this feeling of beatitude, which is the aesthetic emotion. But the value of the personality is an ethical value. The whole sphere of ethic is included in it. Therefore, all artistic or aesthetic pleasure is the enjoyment of something that has ethical value, but this value is not an element of a compound, but the object of aesthetic intuition. 
thus is aesthetic activity deprived of all autonomous existence and reduced to a mere retainer of ethic c Groose, 1895 shows some signs of recognizing aesthetic activity as a theoretic value feeling and intellect he says are the two poles of knowledge and he recognizes the aesthetic fact as internal imitation everything beautiful belongs to aestheticity but not every aesthetic fact is beautiful the beautiful is the representation of sensible pleasure and the ugly of sensible displeasure the sublime is a representation of something powerful in a simple form the comic is a representation of an inferiority which provokes in us the pleasurable feeling of superiority Groose very wisely makes mock of the supposed function of the ugly which hartmann and schlossler had inherited and developed from a long tradition lips and Groose agree in denying aesthetic value to the comic but lips although he gives an excellent analysis of the comic is nevertheless in the trammels of his moralistic thesis and ends by sketching out something resembling the doctrine of the overcoming of the ugly by means of which may be attained a higher aesthetic and sympathetic value labors such as those of lips have been of value since they have cleared away a number of errors that blocked the way and restrained speculation to the field of the internal consciousness similar is the merit of e verone's treatise eighteen eighty three on the double form of aesthetic in which he combats the academic view of the absolute beauty and shows that taine confuses art and science aesthetic and logic he acutely remarks that if the object of art were to reveal the essence of things the greatest artists would be those who best succeed in doing this and the greatest works would be all identical whereas we know that the very opposite is the case Veron was a precursor of gaillot and we seek for scientific system in vain in his book Veron looks upon art as two things the one decorative pleasing eye and ear the other expressive l'expression ému de la personnalité humaine he thought that a decorative art prevailed in antiquity, expressive art in modern times. We cannot here dwell upon the aesthetic theories of men of letters, such as that of E. Zola, developing his thesis of natural science and history mixed, which is known as that of the human document or as the experimental theory, or of Ibsen and the moralization of the art problem, as presented by him and by the Scandinavian school. Perhaps no French writer has written more profoundly upon art than Gustave Flaubert. His views are contained in his correspondence, which has been published l tolstoy wrote his book on art while under the influence of verone and his hatred of the concept of the beautiful art he says communicates the feelings as the word communicates the thoughts but his way of understanding this may be judged from the comparison which he institutes between art and science art has for its mission to make assimilable and sensible what may not have been assimilated in the form of argument there is no science for science's sake no art for art's sake every human effort should be directed toward increasing morality and suppressing violence this amounts to saying that well nigh all the art that the world has hitherto seen is false Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, Aristophanes, Dante, Tasso, Milton, Shakespeare, Raphael, Michelangelo, Bach, Beethoven are all, according to Tolstoy, false reputations made by the critics. We must also class F. Nietzsche with the artists rather than with the philosophers. We should do him an injustice, as with J. Ruskin, were we to express in intellectual terminology his aesthetic affirmations. The criticism which they provoke would be too facile nowhere has nietzsche given a complete theory of art not even in his first book die gibert der tragödie oder griechentum und pessimismus what seems to be theory there is really the confession of the feelings and aspirations of the writer nietzsche was the last splendid representative of the romantic period he was therefore deeply preoccupied with the art problem and with the relation of art to natural science and to philosophy though he never succeeded in definitely fixing those relations from romanticism rather than from schopenhauer he gathered those elements of thought out of which he wove his conception of the two forms of art the apollonian all serene contemplation as expressed in the epic and in the sculpture the dionysiac all tumult and agitation as expressed in music and drama these doctrines are not rigorously proved and their power of resistance to criticism is therefore but slender but they serve to transport the mind to a more lofty spiritual level than any others of the second half of the nineteenth century End of section 25section 26 of aesthetic as science of expression in general linguistic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by k hand aesthetic as science of expression in general linguistic by benedetto croci 
translated by Douglas Ainsley, 1865 to 1948. Historical Summary, Part 8. The most noteworthy thought on aesthetic of this period is perhaps to be found among the aestheticians of special branches of the arts, and since we know that laws relating only to special branches are not conceivable, this thought may be considered as bearing upon the general theory of aesthetic. The Bohemian critic E. Hanslick, 1854, is perhaps the most important of these writers. His work on musical beauty has been translated into several languages. His polemic is chiefly directed against R. Wagner and the pretension of finding in music a determined content of ideas and feelings. He expresses equal contempt for those sentimentalists who derive from music merely pathological effects, passionate excitement, or stimulus for practical activity, in place of enjoying the musical works. If a few Phrygian notes sufficed to instill courage into the soldier facing the enemy, or a Doric melody to assure the fidelity of a wife whose husband was absent, then the loss of Greek music may cause pain to generals and to husbands, but aestheticians and composers will have no reason to deplore it. If every requiem, every lamenting adagio, possessed the power to make us sad, who would be able to support existence in such conditions? But if a true musical work look upon us with the clear and brilliant eyes of beauty, we feel ourselves bound by its invincible fascination, though its theme be all the sorrows of the century. For Hanslick, the only end of music was form, or musical beauty. The followers of Herbert showed themselves very tender toward this unexpected and vigorous ally, and Hanslick, not to be behindhand in politeness, returned their compliments by referring to Herbert and to R. Zimmerman in the later editions of his work as having completely developed the great aesthetic principle of form. Unfortunately, Hanslick meant something altogether different from the Herbertians by his use of the word form. Symmetry, merely acoustic relations, and the pleasure of the ear did not constitute the musically beautiful for him. Mathematics were in his view useless in the aesthetic of music. Sonorous forms are not empty, but perfectly full. They cannot be compared to simple lines enclosing a space. They are the spirit, which takes form, making its own bodily configuration. Music is more of a picture than is an arabesque, but it is a picture of which the subject is inexpressible in words, nor is it to be enclosed in a precise concept. In music there is a meaning and a connection, but of a specially musical nature. It is a language which we speak and understand, but which it is impossible to translate. Hanslick admits that music, if it do not render the quality of sentiments, renders their tone or dynamic side, it renders adjectives, if it fail to render substantives, if not murmuring tenderness or impetuous courage, at any rate, the murmuring and the impetuous. The essence of his book is contained in the negation that it is possible to separate form and content in music. Take any motive you will and say where form begins and content ends. Are we to call the sounds content? Very good, but they have already received form. What are we to call form? Sounds again? But they are already form-filled, that is to say, possessing a content. These observations testify to an acute penetration of the nature of art. Hanslick's belief that they were characteristics peculiar to music, not common to every form of art, alone prevented him from seeing further. C. Fielder, published in German in 1887, an extremely luminous work on the origin of artistic activity. He describes eloquently how the passive spectator seems to himself to grasp all reality, as the shows of life pass before him, but at the moment that he tries to realize this artistically, all disappears and leaves him with the emptiness of his own thoughts. Yet by concentration alone do we attain to expression. Art is a language that we gradually learn to speak. Artistic activity is only to be attained by limiting ourselves. It must consist of forms precisely determined, tangible, sensibly demonstrable, precisely because it is spiritual. Art does not imitate nature, for what is nature, but that vast confusion of perceptions and representations that were referred to above. Yet, in a sense, art does imitate nature. It uses nature to produce values of a kind peculiar to itself. Those values are true visibility. Fielder's views correspond with those of his predecessor, Hanslick, but are more rigorously and philosophically developed. The sculptor, A. Hildebrand, may be mentioned with these, as having drawn attention to the nature of art as architectonic rather than imitative, with special application to the art of sculpture. What we miss with these and with other specialists is a broad view of art and language as one and the same thing, the inheritance of all humanity, not of a few persons especially endowed. H. Bergson, in his book on laughter, 1900, falls under the same criticism. He develops his theory of art in a manner analogous to Fielder, and errs like him in looking upon it as something different and exceptional in respect to the language of every moment. He declares that in life the individuality of things escapes us, we see only as much as suffices for our practical ends. 
The influence of language aids this rude simplification. All but proper names are abstractions. Artists arise from time to time who recover the riches hidden beneath the labels of ordinary life. Amid the ruin of idealist metaphysics is to be desired a healthy return to the doctrine of Bumgarten, corrected and enriched with the discoveries that have been made since his time, especially by romanticism and psychology. C. Herman, 1876, announced this return, but his book is a hopeless mixture of empirical precepts and of metaphysical beliefs regarding logic and aesthetic, both of which, he believes, deal not with the empirical thought and experience of the soul, but with the pure and absolute. B. Bosanquet, 1882 gives the following definition of the beautiful as that which has a characteristic or individual expressivity for the sensible perception or for the imagination subject to the conditions of general or abstract expressivity for the same means the problem as posed by this writer by the antithesis of the two german schools of form and content appears to us insoluble though de sanctis left no school in italy his teaching has been cleared of the obscurities that had gathered round it during the last ten years and the thesis of the true nature of history and of its nature altogether different from natural science has also been dealt with in germany although its precise relation to the aesthetic problem has not been made clear such labors and such discussions constitute a more favorable ground for the scientific development of aesthetic than the stars of mystical metaphysic or the stables of positivism and sensualism we have now reached the end of the inquiry into the history of aesthetic speculation, and we are struck with the smallness of the number of those who have seen clearly the nature of the problem. No doubt, amid the crowd of artists, critics, and writers on other subjects, many have incidentally made very just remarks, and if all these were added to the few philosophers, they would form a gallant company. But if, as Schiller truly observed, the rhythm of philosophy consists in a withdrawal from public opinion, in order to return to it with renewed vigor, it is evident that this withdrawal is essential, and indeed that in it lies the whole progress of philosophy. During our long journey we have witnessed grave aberrations from the truth, which were at the same time attempts to reach it. Such were the hedonism of the sophists and rhetoricians of antiquity, of the sensualists of the 18th and second half of the 19th centuries, the moralistic hedonism of Aristophanes and the Stoics, of the Roman electics, of the writers of the Middle Age, and of the Renaissance, the aesthetic and logical hedonism of Plato and the fathers of the Church, the aesthetic mysticism of Platonus, reborn to its greatest triumphs during the classic period of German thought. Through the midst of these variously erroneous theories that traverse the field of thought in all directions runs a tiny rivulet of golden truth. Starting from the subtle empiricism of Aristotle, it flows in the profound penetration of Vico to the 19th century, where it appears again in the masterly analyses of Schleiermacher, Humboldt, and De Sanctis. This brief list shows that the science of aesthetic is no longer to be discovered, but it also shows that it is only at its beginning. The birth of a science is like the birth of a human being. In order to live, a science, like a man, has to withstand a thousand attacks of all sorts. These appear in the form of errors, which must be extirpated, if the science is not to perish. And when one set has been weeded, another crops up. When these have been dealt with, the former errors often return. Therefore, scientific criticism is always necessary. No science can repose on its laurels, complete, unchallenged. Like a human being, it must maintain its position by constant efforts, constant victories over error. The general errors which reveal a negation of the very concept of art have already been dealt with in the historical summary. The particular errors have been exposed in the theory. They may be divided under three heads. One, errors as to the characteristic quality of the aesthetic fact, or two, as to its specific quality, or three, as to its generic quality. These are contradictions of the characteristics of intuition, of theoretic contemplation, and of spiritual activity, which constitute the aesthetic fact. The principal bar to a proper understanding of the true nature of language has been, and still is, rhetoric, with the modern form it has assumed as style. The rhetorical categories are still mentioned in treatises, and often referred to, as having definite existence among the parts of speech. Side by side with such phrases goes that of the double form, or metaphor, which implies that there are two ways of saying the same thing, the one simple, the other ornate. Kant, Herbert, Hegel, and many minor personages have been shown to be victims of the rhetorical categories, and in our own day we have writers in Italy and in Germany who devote much attention to them, such as R. Bogni and G. Grober. The latter employs a phraseology which he borrows from the modern schools of psychology, but this does not alter the true nature of his argument. De Sanctis gave perhaps the clearest and most stimulating advice in his lectures on rhetoric, which he termed anti-rhetoric. But even he failed to systematize his thought, and we may say that the true critic of rhetoric can only be made from the point of view of the aesthetic activity, which, as we know, won, and therefore does not give rise to divisions, and cannot express the same content now in one form, now in another. 
thus only can we drive away the double monster of naked form deprived of imagination and of decorated form which would represent something more than imagination the same remarks apply to artistic and literary styles and to their various laws or rules in modern times they have generally been comprised with rhetoric and although now discredited they cannot be said to have altogether disappeared j d scaliger may be entitled the protagonist of the unities in comparatively modern times it was he who laid the foundations of the classical bastille and supplied tyrants of literature like beaulieu with some of their best weapons lessing opposed the french rules and restrictions with german rules and restrictions giving his opinion that corneille and others had wrongly interpreted aristotle whose rules did not really prevent shakespeare from being included among correct writers lessing undoubtedly believed in intellectual rules for poetry aristotle was the tyrant father of tyrants and we find corneille saying qui est assez de accommodaire avec aristote much in the same way as tartuffe makes with his accommodance avec le ciel in the next century several additions were made to the admitted styles as for instance the tragedie bourgeoisie but these battles of the rules with one another are less interesting than the rebellion against all the rules which began with pietro aretino in the sixteenth century who makes mock of them in the prologues to his comedies giordano bruno took sides against the makers of rules saying that the rules come from the poetry and therefore there are as many genuses and species of true rules as there are genuses and species of true poets when asked how the true poets are to be known he replies by repeating their verses which either cause delight or profit or both guarini too said that the world judges poetry and its sentences without appeal strangely enough it was priest-ridden spain that all through the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries led the van of revolt against the rules and precepts of the grammarians while torquato tasso remained the miserable slave of grammarians unworthy to lick the dust from his feet lope de vega slyly remarked that when he wrote his comedies he locked up the givers of precepts with six keys that they might not reproach him j b marino declared that he knew the rules better than all the pendants in the world but the true rule is to know when to break the rules in accordance with the manners of the day and the taste of the age among the most acute writers of the end of the seventeenth century is to be mentioned gravina who well understood that a work of art must be its own criterion and said so clearly when praising a contemporary for a work which did not enter any one of the admitted categories unfortunately gravina did not clearly formulate his views france of the eighteenth century produced several writers like dubot who declared that men will always prefer the poems that move them to those composed according to rule lamotte combated the unities of place and time and bateau showed himself liberal in respect to rules voltaire although he opposed lamotte and described the three unities as the three great laws of good sense was also capable of declaring that all styles but the tiresome are good and that the best style is that which is best used in england we find home in his elements of criticism deriding the critics for asserting that there must be a precise criterion for distinguishing epic poetry from all other forms of composition literary compositions he held melt into one another just like colors the literary movement at the end of the eighteenth and the beginning of the nineteenth centuries attacked rules of all sorts we will not dwell upon the many encounters of these periods nor record the names of those that conquered gloriously or their excesses in france the preface to the cromwell of v hugo eighteen twenty seven in italy the latera simicera de griostomo were clarions of rebellion the principle first laid down by a w sligel that the form of compositions must be organic and not mechanic resulting in the nature of the subject from its internal development not from an external stamp was enunciated in italy art is always a whole a synthesis but it would be altogether wrong to believe that this empirical defeat of the styles and rules implied their final defeat in philosophy even writers who were capable of dispensing with prejudice when judging works of art once they spoke as philosophers were apt to reassume their beliefs in those categories which empirically they had discarded the spectacle of these literary or rhetorical categories raised by german philosophers to the honors of philosophical deduction is even more amusing than that which afforded amusement to home the truth is that they were unable to free their aesthetic systems of intellectualism although they proclaimed the empire of the mystic idea schelling eighteen o three at the beginning hartmann eighteen ninety at the end of the century furnish a good example of this head and tail schelling in his philosophy of art declares that historically speaking the first place in the styles of poetry is due to epic but scientifically speaking it falls to lyric in truth if poetry be the representation of the infinite in the finite then lyric poetry in which prevails the finite must be its first moment lyric poetry corresponds to the first of the ideal series to reflection to knowledge epic poetry corresponds to the second power to action 
this philosopher finally proceeds to the unification of epic and lyric poetry and from their union he deduces the dramatic form which is in his view the supreme incarnation of the essence and of the insay of every art with hartmann poetry is divided into poetry of declamation and poetry for reading the first is subdivided into epic lyric and dramatic the epic is divided into plastic epic proper epic pictorial epic and lyrical epic lyric is divided into epical lyric lyrical lyric and dramatic lyric dramatic is divided into lyrical dramatic epical dramatic and dramatical dramatic the second readable poetry is divided into poetry which is chiefly epical lyrical and dramatic with the tertiary division of moving comic tragic and humoristic and poetry which can all be read at once like a short story or that requires several sittings like a romance these brief extracts show of what dialectic pirouettes and sublime trivialities even philosophers are capable when they begin to treat of the aesthetic of the tragic comic and humorous such false distinctions are still taught in the, the schools of france and germany and we find a french critic like ferdinand boutonnieri devoting a whole volume to the evolution of literary styles or classes when he really believes to constitute literary history this prejudice less frankly stated still infests many histories of literature even in italy we believe that the falsity of these rules of classes should be scientifically demonstrated in our theory of aesthetic we have shown how we believe that it should be demonstrated the proof of the theory of the limits of the arts has been credited to lessing but his merit should rather be limited to having been the first to draw attention to the problem his solution was false but his achievement nevertheless great in having posed the question clearly no one before him in antiquity in the middle age or in modern times had seriously asked what is the value of the distinction between the arts which of them comes first which of them comes second leonardo da vinci had declared his personal predilection for painting michelangelo for sculpture but the question had not been philosophically treated before lessing lessing's attention was drawn to the problem through his desire to disprove the assertions of spence and of the comte de caylus the former in respect to the close union between poetry and painting in antiquity the latter is believing that a poem was good according to the number of subjects which it should afford the painter lessing argued thus painting manifests itself in space poetry in time the mode of manifestation of painting is through objects which coexist that of poetry through objects which are consecutive the objects which coexist or whose parts are coexistent are called bodies bodies then owing to their visibility are the true objects of painting objects which are consecutive or whose parts are consecutive are called in general actions actions then are the suitable object of poetry he admitted that painting might represent an action but only by means of bodies which make allusion to it that poetry can represent bodies but only by means of actions returning to this theme he explained the action or movement in painting as added by our imagination lessing was greatly preoccupied with the naturalness and the unnaturalness of signs which is tantamount to saying that he believed each art to be strictly limited to certain modes of expression which are only overstepped at the cost of coherency in the appendix to his Laocoon, he quotes Plutarch as saying that one should not chop wood with a key or open a door with an axe. He who should do so would not only be spoiling both those utensils, but would also be depriving himself of the utility of both. He believed that this applied to the arts. The number of philosophers and writers who have attempted empirical classifications of the arts is enormous. It ranges in comparatively recent times from Lessing, by way of Schlosser, solger and hartmann to richard wagner whose theory of the combination of the arts was first mooted in the eighteenth century lotz while reflecting upon the futility of these attempts himself adopts a method which he says is the most convenient and thereby incurs the censure of schlosser this method is in fact suitable for his studies in botany and in zoology but useless for the philosophy of the spirit thus both these thinkers maintained lessing's wrong principle as to the constancy the limits and the peculiar nature of each art who among aestheticians has criticized this principle? Aristotle had a glimpse of the truth when he refused to admit that the distinction between prose and poetry lay in an external fact, the meter. Schleiermacher seems to have been the only one who was thoroughly aware of the difficulty of the problem. In analysis, indeed, he goes so far as to say that what the arts have in common is not the external fact, which is an element of diversity, and connecting such an observation as this with his clear distinction between art and what is called technique, we might argue that Schleiermacher looked upon the divisions between the arts as non-existent. But he does not make this logical inference, and his thought upon the problem continues to be wavering and undecided nebulous uncertain and contradictory as is this portion of schleiermacher's theory 
he has yet the great merit of having doubted lessing's theory and of having asked himself by what right are special arts held to be distinct in art schleiermacher absolutely denied the existence of a beautiful in nature and praised hegel for having sustained this negation hegel did not really deserve this praise as his negation was rather verbal than effective but the importance of this thesis as stated by schleiermacher is very great in so far as he denied the existence of an objective natural beauty not produced by the spirit of man this theory of the beautiful in nature when taken in a metaphysical sense does not constitute an error peculiar to aesthetic science it forms part of a fallacious general theory which can be criticized together with its metaphysic the theory of aesthetic senses that is of certain superior senses such as sight and hearing being the only ones for which aesthetic impressions exist was debated as early as plato the hippus major contains a discussion upon this theme when socrates leads to the conclusion that there exist beautiful things which do not reach us through impressions of eye or ear but further than this there exist things which please the eye but not the ear and vice versa therefore the reason of beauty cannot be visibility or audibility but something different from yet common to both perhaps this question has never been so acutely and so seriously dealt with as in this platonic dialogue holm herder hegel diderot rousseau berkeley all dealt with this problem but in a more or less arbitrary manner herder for instance includes touch with the higher aesthetic senses but hegel removes it as having immediate contact with matter as such and with its immediate sensible qualities schleiermacher with his wanted penetration saw that the problem was not to be solved so easily he refuted the distinction between clear and confused senses he held that the superiority of sight and hearing over the other senses lay in their free activity in their capacity of an activity proceeding from within and able to create forms and sounds without receiving external impressions the eye and the ear are not merely means of perception for in that case there could be no visual and no auditive arts they are also functions of voluntary movements which fill the domain of the senses schleiermacher however considered that the difference was rather one of quantity and that we should allow to the other senses a minimum of independence the sensualists as we know maintain that all the senses are aesthetic that is the hedonistic hypothesis which has been dealt with and disproved in this book we have shown the embarrassment in which hedonists find themselves when they have dubbed all the senses aesthetic or have been obliged to differentiate in an absurd manner some of the senses from the others the only way out of the difficulty lies in abandoning the attempt to unite order of fact so diverse as a representative form of the spirit and the conception of given physical organs or of a given material of impressions the origin of classes of speech and of grammatical forms is to be found in antiquity and as regards the latter the disputes among the alexandrian philosophers the analogists and the anomalists resulted in logic being identified with grammar anything which did not seem logical was excluded from grammar as a deviation the analogists however did not have it all their own way and grammar in the modern sense of the word is a compromise between these extreme views that is it contains something of the thought of chrysippus who composed a treatise to show that the same thing can be expressed with different sounds and of apollonius discolus who attempted to explain what the rigorous analogists refused to admit in their schemes and classifications it is only of late years that we have begun to emerge from the superstitious reverence for grammar inherited from the middle age such writers as pott in his introduction to humboldt and paul in his principium de Sprachgeschichte have done good service in throwing doubt upon the absolute validity of the parts of speech if the old superstitions still survive tenaciously we must attribute this partly to empirical and poetical grammar partly to the venerable antiquity of grammar itself which has led the world to forget its illegitimate and turbid origin the theory of the relativity of taste is likewise ancient and it would be interesting to know whether the saying there's no accounting for tastes could be traced to a merely gustatory origin in this sense the saying would be quite correct as it is quite wrong when applied to aesthetic facts the eighteenth century writers exhibit a pietist perplexity of thought on this subject home for instance after much debate decides upon a common standard of taste which he deduces from the necessity of social life and from what he calls a final cause of course it will not be an easy matter to fix this standard of taste as regards moral conduct we do not seek our models among savages so with regard to taste we must have recourse to those few whose taste has not been corrupted nor spoilt by pleasure who have received good taste from nature and have perfected it by education and by the practice of life if after this has been done there should yet arise disputes it will be necessary to refer to the principles of criticism as laid down in this book by the said home we find similar contradictions in vicious circles in the discourse on taste of david hume 
we search his writings in vain for the distinctive characteristics of the man of taste whose judgments should be final although he asserts that the general principles of taste are universal in human nature and admits that no notice should be accorded to perversions and ignorance yet there exist diversities of taste that are irreconcilable insuperable and blameless but the criticism of the sensualist and relativist positions cannot be made from the point of view of those who proclaim the absolute nature of taste and yet place it among the intellectual concepts it has been shown to be impossible to escape from sensualism and relativity save by falling into the intellectualist error muratori in the eighteenth century is an instance of this he was one of the first to maintain the existence of a rule of taste and of universal beauty andre also spoke of what appears beautiful in a work of art as being not which pleases at once owing to a certain particular dispositions of the faculties of the soul and of the organs of the body but that which has the right of pleasing the reason and reflection through its own excellence voltaire admitted a universal taste which was intellectual as did many others kant appeared and condemned alike the intellectualist and sensualistic error but placing the beautiful in a symbol of morality he failed to discover the imaginative absoluteness of taste later speculative philosophy did not attach importance to the question the correct solution was slow in making its way it lies as we know in the fact that to judge a work of art we must place ourselves in the position of the artist at the time of production and that to judge is to reproduce alexander pope in his essay on criticism was among the first to state this truth a perfect judge will read each work of wit with the same spirit that its author writ remarks equally luminous were made by antonio conti terrasson and heidenreich in the eighteenth century the latter with considerable philosophical development de sanctus gave in his adhesion to this formula but a true theory of aesthetic criticism had not yet been given because for such was necessary not only an exact conception of nature in art but also of the relations between the aesthetic fact and its historical conditions in more recent times has been denied the possibility of aesthetic criticism it has been looked upon as merely individual and capricious and historical criticism has been set up in its place this would be better called a criticism of extrinsic erudition and of bad philosophical inspiration positivist and materialist the true history of literature will always require the reconstruction and then the judgment of the work of art those who have wished to react against such emasculated erudition have often thrown themselves into the opposite extreme that is into a dogmatic abstract intellectualistic or moralistic form of criticism this mention of the history of certain doctrines relating to aesthetic suffices to show the range of error possible in the theory aesthetic has need to be surrounded by a vigilant and vigorous critical literature which shall derive from it and be at once its safeguard and its source of strength end of section twenty six Section 27 of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Panos. Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce. Translated by Douglas Ainsley. Appendix, Part 1. I add here as an appendix, at the request of the author, a translation of his lecture which he delivered before the Third International Congress of Philosophy at Heidelberg on the 2nd of September 1908. The reader will find that it throws a vivid light upon Benedetto Croce's general theory of aesthetic. Pure Intuition and the Lyrical Character of Art A lecture delivered at Heidelberg at the Second General Session of the Third International Congress of Philosophy. There exists an empirical aesthetic, which although it admits the existence of facts, called aesthetic or artistic, yet holds that they are irreducible to a single principle, to a rigorous philosophical concept. It wishes to limit itself to collecting as many of those facts as possible, and in the greatest possible variety, thence at the most proceeding to group them together in classes and types. The logical ideal of this school, as declared on many occasions, is zoology or botany. This aesthetic, when asked what art is, replies by indicating successively single facts, and by saying art is this, and this, and this too is art, and so on indefinitely. Zoology and botany renew the representatives of fauna and of flora in the same way. They calculate that the species renewed amount to some thousand, but believe that they might easily be increased to twenty or a hundred thousand, or even to a million, or to infinity. There is another aesthetic, 
which has been called hedonistic, utilitarian, moralistic, and so on, according to its various manifestations. Its complex denomination should, however, be practicism, because that is precisely what constitutes its essential character. This aesthetic differs from the preceding in the belief that aesthetic or artistic facts are not a merely empirical or nominalistic grouping together, but that all of them possess a common foundation. Its foundation is placed in the practical form of human activity. Those facts are therefore considered, either generically, as manifestations of pleasure and pain, and therefore rather as economic facts, or, more particularly, as a special class of those manifestations, or again, instruments and products of the ethical spirit, which subdues and turns to its own ends individual hedonistic and economic tendencies. There is a third aesthetic, the intellectualist, which, while also recognizing the reducibility of aesthetic facts to philosophical treatment, explains them as particular cases of logical thought, identifying beauty with intellectual truth, art now with the natural sciences, now with philosophy. For this aesthetic, what is prized in art is what is learned from it. The only distinction that it admits between art and science, or of art and philosophy, is at the most that of more or less, or of perfection and imperfection. According to this aesthetic, art would be the whole mass of easy and popular truths, or it would be a transitory form of science, a semi-science and a semi-philosophy, preparatory to the superior and perfect form of science and of philosophy. A fourth aesthetic there is, which may be called agnostic. It springs from the criticism of the positions just now indicated, and being guided by a powerful consciousness of the truth, rejects them all, because it finds them too evidently false, and because it is too loath to admit that art is a simple fact of pleasure or pain, an exercise of virtue, or a fragmentary sketch of science and philosophy. And while rejecting them, it discovers, at the same time, that art is not now this, and now that of those things, or of other things indefinitely, but that it has its own principle and origin. However, it is not able to say what this principle may be, and believes that it is impossible to do so. This aesthetic knows that art cannot be resolved into an empirical concept, knows that pleasure and pain are united with the aesthetic activity only in an indirect manner, that morality has nothing to do with art, that it is impossible to rationalize art, as is the case with science and philosophy, and to prove it beautiful or ugly with the aid of reason. Here, this aesthetic is content to stop, satisfied with a knowledge consisting entirely of negative terms. Finally, there is an aesthetic which I have elsewhere proposed to call mystic. This aesthetic avails itself of those negative terms to define art as a spiritual form without a practical character, because it is theoretic, and without a logical or intellective form, because it is a theoretic form differing alike from those of science and philosophy and superior to both. According to this view, art would be at the highest pinnacle of knowledge, whence what is seen from other points seems narrow and partial. Art would alone reveal the whole horizon, or all the abysses of reality. Now, the five aesthetics so far mentioned are not referable to contingent facts and historical epochs, as are, on the other hand, the denominations of Greek and medieval aesthetic, of Renaissance and 18th century aesthetic, the aesthetic of Wolf and of Herbart, of Vico and of Hegel. These five are, on the contrary, mental attitudes which are found in all periods, although they have not always conspicuous representatives of the kind that are said to become historical. Empirical aesthetic is, for example, called Burke in the 18th, Fechner in the 19th century, moralistic aesthetic is Horace or Plutarch in antiquity, Campanella in modern times, intellectualist or logical aesthetic is Cartesian in the 17th, Leibnizian in the 18th, and Hegelian in the 19th century. Agnostic aesthetic is Francesco Patrizio at the Renaissance, Kant in the 18th century. Mystic aesthetic is called Neoplatonism at the end of the antique world, Romanticism at the beginning of the 19th century, and if it be adorned during the former period with the name of Plotinus, in the latter it will bear the name of Schelling or of Soldier, and not only are those attitudes and mental tendencies common in all epochs, but they are also found to some extent developed or indicated in every thinker and even in every man. 
thus it is somewhat difficult to classify philosophers of aesthetic according to one or the other category because each philosopher also enters more or less into some other or into all the other categories nor can these five conceptions and points of view be looked upon as increasable to ten or twenty or to as many as desired or that i have placed them in a certain order but that they could be capriciously placed in another order if this were so they would be altogether heterogeneous and disconnected among themselves and the attempt to examine and criticize them would seem altogether desperate as also would be that of comparing one with the other or of stating a new one which should dominate them all it is precisely thus that ordinary sceptics look upon various and contrasting scientific views they group them all in the same plane and believing that they can increase them at will conclude that one is as good as another and that therefore every one is free to select that which he prefers from a bundle of falsehoods the conceptions of which we speak are definite in number and appear in a necessary order which is either that here stated by me or another which might be proposed better than mine this would be the necessary order which i should have failed to realize effectively they are connected one with the other and in such a way that the view which follows includes in itself that which precedes it thus if the last of the five doctrines indicated be taken which may be summed up as the proposition that art is a form of the theoretic spirit superior to the scientific and philosophic form and if it be submitted to analysis it will be seen that in it is included in the first place the proposition affirming the existence of a group of facts which are called aesthetic or artistic if such facts did not exist it is evident that no question would arise concerning them and that no systematization would be attempted and this is the truth of empirical aesthetic but there is also contained in it the proposition that the facts examined are reducible to a definite principle or category of the spirit this amounts to saying that they belong either to the practical spirit or to the theoretical or to one of their sub-forms and this is the truth of practicist aesthetic which is occupied with the inquiry as to whether these ever are practical facts and affirms that in every case that they are a special category of the spirit thirdly there is contained in it the proposition that they are not practical facts but facts which should rather be placed near the facts of logic or of thought this is the truth of intellectualistic aesthetic in the fourth place we find also the proposition that aesthetic facts are neither practical nor of that theoretic form which is called logical and intellective they are something which cannot be identified with the categories of pleasure nor of the useful nor with those of ethic nor with those of logical truth they are something of which it is necessary to find a further definition this is the truth of that aesthetic which is termed agnostic or negative when these various propositions are severed from their connection when that is to say the first is taken without the second the second without the third and so on and when each thus mutilated is confined in itself and the inquiry which awaits prosecution is arbitrarily arrested then each one of these gives itself out as the whole of them that is as the completion of the inquiry in this way each becomes error and the truths contained in empiricism in practicism in intellectualism in agnostic and in mystical aesthetic become respectively falsity and these tendencies of speculation are indicated with names of a definitely depreciative coloring imperia becomes empiricism the heuristic comparison of the aesthetic activity with the practical and logical becomes a conclusion and therefore practicism and intellectualism the criticism which rejects false definitions and is itself negative affirms itself as positive and definite becoming agnosticism and so on but the attempt to close a mental process in an arbitrary manner is vain and of necessity causes remorse and self-criticism thus it comes about that each one of those unilateral and erroneous doctrines continually tends to surpass itself and to enter the stage which follows it thus empiricism for example assumes that it can dispense with any philosophical conception of art 
but since it severs art from non-art, and however empirical it be, it will not identify a pen and ink sketch and a table of logarithms as if they were just the same thing, or a painting and milk or blood, although milk and blood both possess colour. Thus empiricism too must at last resort to some kind of philosophical concept. Therefore, we see the empiricists becoming, turn and turn about, hedonists, moralists, intellectualists, agnostics, mystics, and sometimes they are even better than mystics, upholding an excellent conception of art which can only be found fault with because introduced surreptitiously and without justification. If they do not make that progress, it is impossible for them to speak in any way of aesthetic facts. They must return, as regards such facts, to that indifference and to that silence from which they had emerged when they affirmed the existence of these facts and began to consider them in their variety. The same may be said of all other unilateral doctrines. They are all reduced to the alternative of advancing or going back, and in so far as they do not wish to do either, they live amid contradictions and in anguish. But they do free themselves from these more or less slowly, and are thus compelled to advance more or less slowly. And here we discover why it is so difficult and indeed impossible exactly to identify thinkers, philosophers, and writers with one or the other of the doctrines which we have enunciated, because each one of them rebels when he finds himself limited to one of those categories, and it seems to him that he is shut up in prison. It is precisely because those thinkers try to shut themselves up in a unilateral doctrine that they do not succeed, and that they take a step now in one direction, now in another, and are conscious of being now on this side, now on the other, of the criticisms which are addressed to them. But the critics fulfil their duty by putting them in prison, thus throwing into relief the absurdity into which they are led by their irresolution or the resolution not to resolve. And from this necessary connection and progressive order of the various propositions indicated arise also the resolve, the counsel, the exhortation to return, as they say, to this or that thinker, to this or that philosophical school of the past. Certainly, such returns are impossible understood literally. They are also a little ridiculous, like all impossible attempts. We can never return to the past precisely because it is the past. No one is permitted to free himself from the problems which are put by the present, and which he must solve with all the means of the present, which includes in it the means of the past. Nevertheless, it is a fact that the very history of philosophy everywhere resounds with cries of return. Those very people who in our day deride the return to Hume or the return to Kant proceed to advise the return to Schelling or the return to Hegel. This means that we must not understand those returns literally and in a material way. In truth, they do not express anything but the necessity and the eliminability of the logical process explained above, for which the affirmations contained in philosophical problems appear connected with one another in such a way that the one follows the other, surpasses it, and includes it in itself. Empiricism, practicism, intellectualism, agnosticism, mysticism are eternal stages of the search for truth. They are eternally relived and rethought in the truth which each contains. Thus, it would be necessary for him who had not yet turned his attention to aesthetic facts to begin by passing them before his eyes. That is to say, he must first traverse the empirical stage, about equivalent to that occupied by mere men of letters and mere amateurs of art. And while he is at this stage, he must be aroused to feel the want of a principle of explanation, by making him compare his present knowledge with the facts, and see if they are explained by it that is to say, if they be utilitarian and moral, or logical and intellective. Then we should drive him who has made this examination to the conclusion that the aesthetic activity is something different from all known forms, a form of the spirit which it yet remains to categorize. For the empiricists of aesthetic, intellectualism and moralism represent progress. For the intellectualists, hedonistic and moralistic alike, agnosticism is progress and may be called Kant. 
but for Kantians who are real Kantians and not neo-Kantians, progress is represented by the mystical and romantic point of view, not because this comes after the doctrine of Kant chronologically, but because it surpasses it ideally. In this sense, and in this sense alone, we should now return to the romantic aesthetic. We should return to it because it is ideally superior to all the researches in aesthetic made in the studies of psychologists, of physiopsychologists, and of psychophysiologists of the universities of Europe and of America. It is ideally superior to the sociological, comparative, prehistoric aesthetic, which studies especially the art of savages, of children, of madmen, and of idiots. It is ideally superior also to that other aesthetic, which has recourse to the conceptions of the genetic pleasure, of games, of illusion, of self-illusion, of association, of hereditary habit, of sympathy, of social efficiency, and so on. It is ideally superior to the attempts at logical explanation, which have not altogether ceased, even today, although they are somewhat rare, because, to tell the truth, fanaticism for logic cannot be called the failing of our times. Finally, it is ideally superior to that aesthetic which repeats with Kant that the beautiful is finality without the idea of end, disinterested pleasure, necessary and universal, which is neither theoretical nor practical, but participates in both forms, or combines them in itself in an original and ineffable manner. But we should return to it, bringing with us the experience of a century of thought, the new facts collected, the new problems that have arisen, the new ideas that have matured. Thus we shall return again to the stage of mystical and romantic aesthetic, but not to the personal and historical stage of its representatives, for in this matter at least they are certainly inferior to us. They lived a century ago, and therefore inherited so much less of the problems and of the results of thought which day by day mankind laboriously accumulates. They should return, but not to remain there, because if a return to the romantic aesthetic be advisable for the Kantians, while the idealists should not be advised to return to Kant, that is to say, to a lower stage which represents a recession, so those who come over or already find themselves on the ground of mystical aesthetic should, on the other hand, be advised to proceed yet further in order to attain to a doctrine which represents a stage above it. This doctrine is that of the pure intuition, or what amounts to the same thing of pure expression, a doctrine which also numbers representatives in all times, and which may be said to be imminent alike in all the discourses that are held and in all the judgments that are passed upon art, as in all the best criticism and artistic and literary history. This doctrine arises logically from the contradictions of mystical aesthetic, I say logically because it contains in itself those contradictions and their solution, although historically, and this point does not at present concern us, that critical process be not always comprehensible, explicit and apparent. Mystical aesthetic, which makes of art the supreme function of the theoretic spirit, or at least a function superior to that of philosophy, becomes involved in inextricable difficulties. How could art ever be superior to philosophy, if philosophy make of art its object, that is to say, if it place art beneath itself, in order to analyse and define it? And what could this new knowledge be, supplied by art and the aesthetic activity, appearing when the human spirit has come full circle, and after it has imagined, perceived, thought, abstracted, calculated and constructed the whole world of thought and history? As the result of those difficulties and contradictions, mystical aesthetic itself also exhibits the tendency either to surpass its boundary or to sink below its proper level. The descent takes place when it falls back into agnosticism, affirming that art is art, that is, a spiritual form, altogether different from the others and ineffable, or worse, where it conceives art as a sort of repose or as a game, as though diversion could ever be a category and the spirit no repose repose. We find an attempt at overpassing its proper limit, when art is placed below philosophy as inferior to it. But this overpassing remains a simple attempt, because the conception of art as instrument of universal truth is always firmly held, save that this instrument is declared less perfect and less efficacious than the philosophical instrument. 
Thus they fall back again into intellectualism from another side. These mistakes of mystical aesthetic were manifested during the Romantic period in some celebrated paradoxes, such as those of art as irony and of the death of art. They seemed calculated to drive philosophers to desperation as to the possibility of solving the problem of the nature of art, since every path of solution appeared closed. Indeed, whoever reads the aestheticians of the Romantic period feels strongly inclined to believe himself at the heart of the inquiry and to nourish a confident hope of immediate discovery of the truth. Above all, the affirmation of the theoretic nature of art and of the difference between its cognitive method and that of science and logic is felt as a definite conquest, which can indeed be combined with other elements, but which must not in any case be allowed to slip between the fingers. And further, it is not true that all ways of solution are closed, or that all have been attempted. There is at least one still open that can be tried, and it is precisely that for which we resolutely declare ourselves, the aesthetic of the pure intuition. This aesthetic reasons as follows. Hitherto, in all attempts to define the place of art, it has been sought, either at the summit of the theoretic spirit, above philosophy, or at least in the circle of philosophy itself. But is not the loftiness of the search the reason why no satisfactory result has hitherto been obtained? Why not invert the attempt, and instead of forming the hypothesis that art is one of the summits or the highest grade of the theoretic spirit, form the very opposite hypothesis, namely that it is one of the lower grades, or the lowest of all? Perhaps such epithets as lower and lowest are irreconcilable with the dignity and with the splendid beauty of art, but in the philosophy of the spirit such words as lowest, weak, simple, elementary, possess only the value of a scientific terminology. All the forms of the spirit are necessary, and the higher is so only because there is the lower, and the lower is as much to be despised or less to be valued to the same extent as the first step of a stair is despicable or of less value in respect to the topmost step. Let us compare art with the various forms of the theoretic spirit, and let us begin with the sciences which are called natural or positive. The aesthetic of pure intuition makes it clear that the said sciences are more complex than history because they presuppose historical material, that is, collections of things that have happened to men or animals, to the earth or to the stars. They submit this material to a further treatment, which consists in the abstraction and systematization of the historical facts. History, then, is less complex than the natural sciences. History further presupposes the world of the imagination and the pure philosophical concepts or categories, and produces its judgments or historical propositions by means of the synthesis of the imagination with the concept. And philosophy may be said to be even less complex than history, insofar as it is distinguished from the former as an activity whose special function it is to make clear the categories or pure concepts, neglecting, in a certain sense at any rate, the world of phenomena. If we compare art with the three forms above mentioned, it must be declared inferior, that is to say, less complex than the natural sciences, insofar as it is altogether without abstractions. In so far as it is without conceptual determinations and does not distinguish between the real and the unreal, what has really happened and what has been dreamed, it must be declared inferior to history. In so far as it fails altogether to surpass the phenomenal world and does not attain to the definitions of the pure concepts, it is inferior to philosophy itself. It is also inferior to religion, assuming that religion is, as it is, a form of speculative truth, standing between thought and imagination. Art is governed entirely by imagination, its only riches are images. Art does not classify objects, nor pronounce them real or imaginary, nor qualify them, nor define them. Art feels and represents them nothing more. Art, therefore, is intuition, in so far as it is a mode of knowledge not abstract, but concrete, and in so far as it uses the real without changing or falsifying it, in so far as it apprehends it immediately, before it is modified and made clear by the concept, it must be called pure intuition. The strength of art lies in being thus simple, nude, and poor. 
Its strength, as often happens in life, arises from its very weakness, hence its fascination. If, to employ an image much used by philosophers for various ends, we think of man in the first moment that he becomes aware of theoretical life, with mind still clear of every abstraction and of every reflection, in that first purely intuitive instant he must be a poet. He contemplates the world with ingenuous and admiring eyes. He sinks and loses himself altogether in that contemplation. By creating the first representations and by thus inaugurating the life of knowledge, art continually renews within our spirit the aspects of things which thought has submitted to reflection and the intellect to abstraction. Thus art perpetually makes us poets again. Without art, thought would lack the stimulus, the very material for its hermeneutic and critical labour. Art is the root of all our theoretic life. To be the root, not the flower or the fruit, is the function of art, and without a root there can be no flower and no fruit. End of section 27《Section 28 of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Panos.《Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic》by Benedetto Croce. Translated by Douglas Ainsley. Appendix. Part 2. Such is the theory of art as pure intuition in its fundamental conception. This theory, then, takes its origin from the criticism of the loftiest of all the other doctrines of aesthetic, from the criticism of mystical or romantic aesthetic, and contains in itself the criticism and the truth of all the other aesthetics. It is not here possible to allow ourselves to illustrate its other aspects. Such would be those of the identity which it lays down, between intuition and expression, between art and language. Suffice it to say, as regard the former, that he alone who divides the unity of the spirit into soul and body can have faith in a pure act of the soul, and therefore in an intuition, which should exist as an intuition, and yet be without its body, expression. Expression is the actuality of intuition, as action is of will, and in the same way as will not exercised in action is not will, so an intuition unexpressed is not an intuition. As regards the second point, I will mention in passing that in order to recognize the identity of art and language, it is needful to study language not in its abstraction and in grammatical detail, but in its immediate reality and in all its manifestations, spoken and sung, phonic and graphic. And we should not take at hazard any proposition and declare it to be aesthetic, because if all propositions have an aesthetic side, precisely because intuition is the elementary form of knowledge and is, as it were, the garment of the superior and more complex forms, all are not purely aesthetic, but some are philosophical, historical, scientific or mathematical. Some, in fact, of these are more aesthetic or logical. They are aesthetical-logical. Aristotle, in his time, distinguished between semantic and apophantic propositions, and noted that if all propositions be semantic, not all are apophantic. Language is art, not in so far as it is apophantic, but in so far as it is generically semantic. It is necessary to note in it the side by which it is expressive and nothing but expressive. It is also well to observe, though this may seem superfluous, that it is not necessary to reduce the theory of pure intuition, as has been sometimes done, to a historical fact or to a psychological concept. Because we recognize in poetry, as it were, the ingenuousness, the freshness, the barbarity of the spirit, it is not therefore necessary to limit poetry to youth and to barbarian peoples, though we recognize language as the first act of taking possession of the world achieved by man, we must not imagine that language is born ex nihilo, once only in the course of the ages, and that later generations merely adopt the ancient instrument, applying it to a new order of things while lamenting its slight adaptability to the usage of civilized times. Art, 
poetry, intuition, and immediate expression are the moment of barbarity and of ingenuousness, which perpetually recur in the life of the spirit. They are youth, that is, not chronological, but ideal. There exist very prosaic barbarians and very prosaic youths, as there exist poetical spirits of the utmost refinement and civilization. The mythology of those proud, gigantic Patagonians, of whom our Vico was wont to discourse, or of those bons Girons, who were lately a theme of conversation, must be looked upon as forever superseded. But there arises an apparently very serious objection to the aesthetic of pure intuition, giving occasion to doubt whether this doctrine, if it represent progress in respect to the doctrines which have preceded it, yet is also a complete and definite doctrine as regards the fundamental concept of art. Should it be submitted to a dialectic, by means of which it must be surpassed and dissolved into a more lofty point of view? The doctrine of pure intuition makes the value of art to consist of its power of intuition, in such a manner that just in so far as pure and concrete intuitions are achieved, will art and beauty be achieved. But if attention be paid to judgments of people of good taste and of critics, and to what we all say when we are warmly discussing works of art and manifesting our praise or blame of them, it would seem that what we seek in art is something quite different, or at least something more than simple force and intuitive and expressive purity. What pleases and what is sought in art, what makes beat the heart and enraptures admiration, is life, movement, emotion, warmth, the feeling of the artist. This alone affords the supreme criterion for distinguishing true from false works of art, those with insight from the failures. Where there are emotion and feeling, much is forgiven. Where they are wanting, nothing can make up for them. Not only are the most profound thoughts and the most exquisite culture incapable of saving a work of art which is looked upon as cold, but richness of imagery, ability and certainty in the reproduction of the real, in description, characterization and composition, and all other knowledge, only serve to arouse the regret that so great a price has been paid and such labours endured in vain. We do not ask of an artist instruction as to real facts and thoughts, nor that he should astonish us with the richness of his imagination, but that he should have a personality, in contact with which the soul of the hearer or spectator may be heated. A personality of any sort is asked for in this case. Its moral significance is excluded. Let it be sad or glad, enthusiastic or distrustful, sentimental or sarcastic, benignant or malign, but it must be a soul. Art criticism would seem to consist altogether in determining if there be a personality in the work of art and of what sort. A work that is a failure is an incoherent work, that is to say, a work in which no single personality appears, but a number of disaggregated and jostling personalities, that is, really, none. There is no further correct significance than this in the researches that are made as to the verisimilitude, the truth, the logic, the necessity of a work of art. It is true that many protests have been made by artists, critics, and philosophers by profession against the characteristic of personality. It has been maintained that the bad artist leaves traces of his personality in the work of art, whereas the great artist cancels them all. It has been further maintained that the artist should portray the reality of life, and that he should not disturb it with the opinions, judgments, and personal feelings of the author, and that the artist should give the tears of things, and not his own tears. Hence impersonality, not personality, has been proclaimed to be the characteristic of art, that is to say, the very opposite. However, it will not be difficult to show that what is really meant by this opposing formula is the same as in the first case. The theory of impersonality really coincides with that of personality in every point. The opposition of the artists, critics, and philosophers above mentioned was directed against the invasion by the empirical and volitional personality of the artist of the spontaneous and ideal personality which constitutes the subject of the work of art. 
For instance, artists who do not succeed in representing the force of piety or of love of country add to their colourless imaginings declamation or theatrical effects, thinking thus to arouse such feelings. In like manner, certain orators and actors introduce into a work of art an emotion extraneous to the work of art itself. Within these limits, the opposition of the upholders of the theory of impersonality was most reasonable. On the other hand, there has also been exhibited an altogether irrational opposition to personality in the work of art. Such is the lack of comprehension and intolerance evinced by certain souls for others differently constituted of calm for agitated souls, for example. Here we find, at bottom, the claim of one sort of personality to deny that of another. Finally, it has been possible to demonstrate from among the examples given of impersonal art in the romances and dramas called naturalistic that in so far and to the extent that these are complete artistic works, they possess personality. This holds good even when this personality lies in a wandering or perplexity of thought regarding the value to be given to life or in blind faith in the natural sciences and in modern sociology. Where every trace of personality was really absent and its place taken by the pedantic quest for human documents, the description of certain social classes and the generic or individual process of certain maladies, there the work of art was absent a work of science of more or less superficiality, and without the necessary proofs and control, filled its place. There is no upholder of impersonality, but experiences a feeling of fatigue for a work of the utmost exactitude in the reproduction of reality in its empirical sequence, or of industrious and apathetic combination of images. He asks himself why such a work was executed, and recommends the author to adopt some other profession, since that of artist was not intended for him. Thus it is without doubt that if pure intuition and pure expression, which is the same thing, are indispensable in the work of art, the personality of the artist is equally indispensable. If, to quote the celebrated words in our own way, the classic moment of perfect representation or expression be necessary for the work of art, the romantic movement of feeling is not less necessary. Poetry, or art in general, cannot be exclusively ingenuous or sentimental. It must be both ingenuous and sentimental. And if the first or representative moment be termed epic, and the second, which is sentimental, passionate and personal, be termed lyric, then poetry and art must be at once epic and lyric, or, if it please you better, dramatic. We use these words here, not at all in their empirical and intellectualist sense, as employed to designate special classes of works of art, exclusive of other classes, but in that of elements or moments, which must of necessity be found united in every work of art, how diverse soever it may be in other respects. Now this irrefutable conclusion seems to constitute exactly that above-mentioned, apparently serious objection to the doctrine which defines art as pure intuition. But if the essence of art be merely theoretic, and it is intuibility, can it, on the other hand, be practical, that is to say, feeling, personality, and passionality? Or, if it be practical, how can it be theoretic? It will be answered that feeling is the content, intuibility the form, but form and content do not in philosophy constitute a duality, like water and its recipient. In philosophy, content is form and form is content. Here, on the other hand, form and content appear to be different from one another. The content is of one quality, the form of another. Thus art appears to be the sum of two qualities, or as Herbart used to say in his time, of two values. Accordingly, we have an altogether unmaintainable aesthetic, as is clear from recent largely vulgarized doctrines of aesthetic as operating with the concept of the infused personality. Here we find, on the one hand, things intuable, lying dead and soulless, on the other, the artist's feeling and personality. The artist is then supposed to put himself into things, by an act of magic to make them live and palpitate, love and adore. 
But if we start with the distinction, we can never again reach unity. The distinction requires an intellectual act, and what the intellect has divided, intellect or reason alone, not art or imagination, can reunite and synthetize. Thus the aesthetic of infusion or transfusion, when it does not fall into the antiquated hedonistic doctrines of agreeable illusion, of games, and generally of what affords a pleasurable emotion, or of moral doctrines, where art is a symbol and an allegory of the good and the true, is yet not able, despite its airs of modernity and its psychology, to escape the fate of the doctrine which makes of art a semi-imaginative conception of the world, like religion. The process that it describes is mythological, not aesthetic. It is a making of gods or of idols. To make one's gods is an unhappy art, said an old Italian poet, but if it be not unhappy, certainly it is not poetic and not aesthetic. The artist does not make the gods, because he has other things to do. Another reason is that, to tell the truth, he is so ingenuous and so absorbed in the image that attracts him that he cannot perform that act of abstraction and conception, wherein the image must be surpassed and made the allegory of a universal, though it be of the crudest description. This recent theory, then, is of no use. It leads back to the difficulties arising from the admission of two characteristics of art, intuibility and lyricism, not unified. We must recognize either that the duality must be destroyed and proved illusory, or that we must proceed to a more ample conception of art, in which that of pure intuibility would remain merely secondary or particular and to destroy and prove it illusory must consist in showing that here too form is content, and that pure intuition is itself lyricism. Now the truth is precisely this, pure intuition is essentially lyricism. All the difficulties concerning this question arise from not having thoroughly understood that concept, from having failed to penetrate its true nature and to explore its multiple relations. When we consider the one attentively, we see the other bursting from its bosom, or better, the one and the other reveal themselves as one and the same, and we escape from the desperate trilemma of either denying the lyrical and personal character of art, or of asserting that it is adjunctive, external, and accidental, or of excogitating a new doctrine of aesthetic, which we do not know where to find. In fact, as has already been remarked, what can pure intuition mean but intuition pure of every abstraction, of every conceptual element, and for this reason neither science, history, nor philosophy? This means that the content of the pure intuition cannot be either an abstract concept, or a speculative concept or idea, or a conceptualized, that is, historicized, representation nor can it be a so-called perception, which is a representation intellectually and so historically discriminated. But outside logic in its various forms and blendings, no other psychic content remains, save that which is called appetites, tendencies, feelings, and will. These things are all the same and constitute the practical form of the spirit, in its infinite gradations and in its dialectic, pleasure and pain, Pure intuition, then, since it does not produce concepts, must represent the will in its manifestations, that is to say, it can represent nothing but states of the soul, and states of the soul are passionality, feeling, personality, which are found in every art and determine its lyrical character. Where this is absent, art is absent, precisely because pure intuition is absent, and we have at the most in exchange for it that reflex, philosophical, historical, or scientific. In the last of these, passion is represented not immediately, but mediately, or to speak exactly, it is no longer represented but thought, thus the origin of language, that is, its true nature, has several times been placed in interjection. Thus, too, Aristotle, when he wished to give an example of those propositions which were not apophantic, but generically semantic, we should say not logical, but purely aesthetic, and did not predicate the logically true and false, but nevertheless said something, gave as example invocation or prayer, hey and che. 
He added that these propositions do not appertain to logic, but to rhetoric and poetic. A landscape is a state of the soul. A great poem may all be contained in an exclamation of joy, of sorrow, of admiration, or of lament. The more objective is a work of art, by so much the more it is poetically suggestive. If this deduction of lyricism from the intimate essence of pure intuition do not appear easily acceptable, the reason is to be sought in two very deep-rooted prejudices, of which it is useful to indicate here the genesis. The first concerns the nature of the imagination, and its likenesses to and differences from fancy. Imagination and fancy have been clearly distinguished thus by certain aestheticians, and among them De Sanctis, as also in discussions relating to concrete art. They have held fancy, not imagination, to be the special faculty of the poet and the artist. Not only does a new and bizarre combination of images, which is vulgarly called invention, not constitute the artist, but ne fait rien à l'affaire, as Alceste remarked with reference to the length of time expended upon writing a sonnet. Great artists have often preferred to treat groups of images which had already been many times used as material for works of art. The novelty of these new works has been solely that of art or form, that is to say, of the new accent which they have known how to give the old material, of the new way in which they have felt and therefore intuified it, thus creating new images upon the old ones. These remarks are all obvious and universally recognized as true, but if mere imagination as such has been excluded from art, it has not therefore been excluded from the theoretic spirit, hence the disinclination to admit that a pure intuition must of necessity express a state of the soul, whereas it also may consist, as they believe, of a pure image without a content of feeling. If we form an arbitrary image of any sort, stands per day in uno, say, of a bullock's head on a horse's body, would not this be an intuition, a pure intuition, certainly quite without any content of reflection? Would one not attain to a work of art in this way, or at any rate to an artistic motive? Certainly not. For the image given as an instance, and every other image that may be produced by the imagination, not only is not a pure intuition, but it is not a theoretic product of any sort. It is a product of choice, as was observed in the formula used by our opponents, and choice is external to the world of thought and contemplation. It may be said that imagination is a practical artifice, or game, played upon that patrimony of images possessed by the soul, whereas the fancy, the translation of practical into theoretical values, of states of the soul into images, is the creation of that patrimony itself. From this we learn that an image which is not the expression of a state of the soul is not an image, since it is without any theoretical value, and therefore it cannot be an obstacle to the identification of lyricism and intuition. But the other prejudice is more difficult to eradicate, because it is bound up with the metaphysical problem itself, on the various solutions of which depend the various solutions of the aesthetic problem and vice versa. If art be intuition, would it therefore be any intuition that one might have of a physical object appertaining to external nature? If I open my eyes and look at the first object that they fall upon, a chair or a table, a mountain or a river, shall I have performed by doing so an aesthetic act? If so, what becomes of the lyrical character of which we have asserted the necessity? If not, what becomes of the intuitive character of which we have affirmed the equal necessity and also its identity with the former? Without doubt, the perception of a physical object as such does not constitute an artistic fact, but precisely for the reason that it is not a pure intuition, but a judgment of perception, and implies the application of an abstract concept, which in this case is physical or belonging to external nature. And with this reflection and perception, we find ourselves at once outside the domain of pure intuition. 
we could have a pure perception of a physical object in one way only. That is to say, if physical or external nature were a metaphysical reality, a truly real reality, and not, as it is, a construction or abstraction of the intellect. If such were the case, man would have an immediate intuition, in his first theoretical moment, both of himself and of external nature, of the spiritual and of the physical in an equal degree. This represents the dualistic hypothesis, but just as dualism is incapable of providing a coherent system of philosophy, so is it incapable of providing a coherent aesthetic. If we admit dualism, we must certainly abandon the doctrine of art as pure intuition, but we must at the same time abandon all philosophy. But art on its side tacitly protests against metaphysical dualism. It does so because, being the most immediate form of knowledge, it is in contact with activity, not with passivity, with interiority, not exteriority, with spirit, not with matter, and never with a double order of reality. Those who affirm the existence of two forms of intuition, the one external or physical, the other subjective or aesthetic, the one cold and inanimate, the other warm and lively, the one imposed from without, the other coming from the inner soul, attain without doubt to the distinctions and opposition positions of the vulgar or dualistic consciousness, but their aesthetic is vulgar. The lyrical essence of pure intuition and of art helps to make clear what we have already observed concerning the persistence of the intuition and of the fancy in the higher grades of the theoretical spirit, why philosophy, history and science have always an artistic side, and why their expression is subject to aesthetic valuation. The man who ascends from art to thought does not by so doing abandon his volitional and practical base, and therefore he too finds himself in a particular state of the soul, the representation of which is intuitive and lyrical and accompanies of necessity the development of his ideas. Hence the various styles of thinkers, solemn or jocose, troubled or gladsome, mysterious and involved or level and expansive. But it would not be correct to divide intuition immediately into two classes, the one of aesthetic, the other of intellectual or logical intuitions. Owing to the persistence of the artistic element in logical thought, because the relation of degrees is not the relation of classes, and copper is copper, whether it be found alone or in combination as bronze. Further, this close connection of feeling and intuition in pure intuition throws much light on the reasons which have so often caused art to be separated from the theoretic and confounded with the practical activity. The most celebrated of these confusions are those formulated about the relativity of tastes and of the impossibility of reproducing, tasting, and correctly judging the art of the past, and in general the art of others. A life lived, a feeling felt, a volition willed, are certainly impossible to reproduce, because nothing happens more than once, and my situation at the present moment is not that of any other being, nor is it mine of the moment before, nor will be of the moment to follow. But art remakes ideally, and ideally expresses my momentary situation. Its image, produced by art, becomes separated from time and space, and can be again made and again contemplated in its ideal reality from every point of time and space. It belongs not to the world, but to the superworld, not to the flying moment, but to eternity. Thus life passes, but art endures. Finally, we obtain from this relation between the intuition and the state of the soul the criterion of exact definition of the sincerity required of artists, which is itself also an essential request. It is essential precisely because it means that the artist must have a state of the soul to express, which really amounts to saying that he must be an artist. His must be a state of the soul really experienced, not merely imagined, because imagination, as we know, is not a work of truth. But, on the other hand, the demand for sincerity does not go beyond asking for a state of the soul, and that the state of soul expressed in the work of art be a desire or an action. 
It is altogether indifferent to aesthetic whether the artist have had only an aspiration or have realized that aspiration in his empirical life. All that is quite indifferent in the sphere of art. Here we also find the confutation of that false conception of sincerity which maintains that the artist, in his volitional or practical life, should be at one with his dream or with his incubus. Whether or not he have been so is a matter that interests his biographer, not his critic. It belongs to history, which separates and qualifies that which art does not discriminate but represents. End of section 28。section 29 of aesthetic as science of expression and general linguistic。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce. Translated by Douglas Ainsley. Appendix, Part 3. This attitude of indiscrimination and indifference. Observed by art in respect to history and philosophy, is also foreshadowed at that place of the De Interpretatione, to which we have already referred, to obtain thence the confirmation of the thesis of the identity of art and language, and another confirmation, that of the identity of lyric and pure intuition. It is really an admirable passage, containing many profound truths in a few short, simple words although, as is natural, without full consciousness of their richness. Aristotle, then, is still discussing the said rhetorical and poetical propositions, semantic and not apophantic, and he remarks that in them there rules no distinction between true and false. To aletheuian hai pseudothai uk hyparche. Art, in fact, is in contact with palpitating reality, but does not know that it is so in contact, and therefore is not truly in contact. Art does not allow itself to be troubled with the abstractions of the intellect, and therefore does not make mistakes. But it does not know that it does not make mistakes. If art then, to return to what we said at the beginning, be the first and most ingenuous form of knowledge, it cannot give complete satisfaction to man's need to know, and therefore cannot be the ultimate end of the theoretic spirit. Art is the dream of the life of knowledge. Its complement is waking, lyricism no longer, but the concept, no longer the dream, but the judgment. Thought could not be without fancy, but thought surpasses and contains in itself the fancy, transforms the image into perception, and gives to the world of dream the clear distinctions and the firm contours of reality. Art cannot achieve this. And however great be our love of art, that cannot raise it in rank any more than the love one may have for a beautiful child can convert it into an adult. We must accept the child as a child, the adult as an adult. Therefore, the aesthetic of pure intuition, while it proclaims energetically the autonomy of art and of the aesthetic activity, is at the same time averse to all aestheticism, that is, to every attempt at lowering the life of thought in order to elevate that of fancy. The origin of aestheticism is the same as that of mysticism. Both proceed from a rebellion against the predominance of the abstract sciences and against the undue abuse of the principle of causation in metaphysic. When we pass from the stuffed animals of the zoological museums, from anatomical reconstructions, from tables of figures, from classes and subclasses constituted by means of abstract characters, or from the fixation and mechanization of life for the ends of naturalistic science, to the pages of the poets, to the pictures of the painters, to the melodies of the composers. When in fact we look upon life with the eye of the artist, we have the impression that we are passing from death to life, from the abstract to the concrete, from fiction to reality. We are inclined to proclaim that only in art and in aesthetic contemplation is truth, 
and that science is either charlatanesque pedantry or a modest practical expedient. And certainly, art has the superiority of its own truth, simple, small, and elementary though it be, over the abstract, which as such is altogether without truth. But in violently rejecting science and frantically embracing art, that very form of the theoretic spirit is forgotten by means of which we can criticize science and recognize the nature of art. Now this theoretic spirit, since it criticizes science, is not science, and, as reflective consciousness of art, is not art. Philosophy, the supreme fact of the theoretic world, is forgotten. This error has been renewed in our day, because consciousness of the limits of the natural sciences and of the value of the truth which belongs to intuition and to art have been renewed. But as, a century ago, during the idealistic and romantic period, there were some who reminded the fanatics for art and the artists who were transforming philosophy that art was not the most lofty form of apprehending the absolute. So, in our day, it is necessary to awaken the consciousness of thought. And one of the means for attaining this end is an exact understanding of the limits of art. That is, the construction of a solid aesthetic. End of section 29. End of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce. Translated by Douglas Ainsley.